All right, before we begin our first panel, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, if you are attending here in person, you should have an agenda for today's summit in your welcome bag. And if you're attending virtually, you should have received an, an agenda via email. We have a few short breaks during the summer, uh, so, sorry, during the summit, and there will be a break lunch between 12.05 and 12.30. The keynote speaker will be introduced at 12.30 p.m. as the in-person uh, attendees continue with lunch. For our, our virtual audience, lunch break, we will feature a series of videos from Vote for Access, a five-part series addressing the problems with voting for people with disabilities and some solutions that everyone should know. We will leave five minutes at the end of each page for questions. If you are with us in person, there are index cards on your table. Please write down your question and hand them to Paula. Is Paula here inside? All right, thank you during the first panel and yes. then, sorry, Christella and Juliet for the remaining panels and I'll introduce them when they're in here, when they're in the room. Uh, if you uh, need, an accommodate, need an accommodation asking a question, please just simply raise your hand. If you're attending virtually, you can add your questions to the chat and our chat monitors will relay the questions to us. For those of you who are here at the Embassy Suites Hotel, the restrooms are located uh, to your right as you exit the room at the end of the hall. We have a number of Disability Rights Florida staff here in person today. Each are wearing a name badge on a lanyard similar to mine. And if you have any questions, please seek them out. Olivia and Laura, Olivia's over here. Here's Laura. Hey, Laura's in the front, all right. Olivia and, Al and Laura are here um during and after the event to register people to vote and also to update your voter registration paula and dawn are available to answer questions about disability rights florida services and dawn can help with our intake process if you feel you need to talk with one of our legal staff all right so let's get started our first panel is titled crypt the vote making vote by mail accessible as most of you are aware, the popular hashtag Crypt the Vote is a nonpartisan campaign to engage both voters and politicians in the productive discussion about disability issues in the U.S. with the hope that disability takes on a greater prominence within the American political landscape. We've asked advocates with lived experiences to join those implementing Florida's accessible vote by mail program to discuss their perspectives on the successes and pitfalls of the current system, as well as what the future holds for accessible, uh, accessible voting. So I'm happy to introduce our moderators for today's panel. Uh, both serve as interns on DRF's public policy team. Juliet Brown, who is about to earn her master's in social work from Florida State University, and Christella Jean-Pierre, who is enrolled in the Bachelor of Social Work program at Florida A&M University. It's all yours. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Okay. <laughs> um, as Robin said, my name is Christella. As Robin said, my name is Christella Jean-Pierre, and this is my co-moderator, Juliette Brown, and today we'll be facilitating the conversation when it comes to vote by mail. Can you guys hear me? Oh, okay. So today we will be facilitating the conversation regards to accessible vote by mail. And to begin, we're going to start with the panelists and allow you guys to introduce yourselves, um, your area of work and your expertise. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Aaron Wilson. I'm the president and founder of Enhanced Voting. We are the uh, accessible vote by mail provider for 41 counties here in the state of Florida. We're based in Jacksonville. We're very happy to be here in person. We're very happy that um, Disability Rights Florida and Access to Vote um, is having us on this panel. We look forward to engaging with you, listening, learning, uh, talking about the future, the future holds, and, and how we can make voting more accessible and more secure. 
Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm Julia Brown. It's nice to see all of you today. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Marcia Bukala. I currently live in Orange County. I've lived in Florida for the last five years, and I'm a user of both the accessible vote by mail and the accessible voting machines at polling places. Great, thank you so much. And I believe our other people are um, on Zoom, so they can introduce themselves as well. Good morning, everyone. This is Alexander Mosca. Could someone confirm that they can hear me? Hi, we can hear you. Thank you so much. Great, thank you for confirming that. So yeah, my name is Alexander Mosca. I work with the Leon County Supervisor of Elections Office. Uh, and in that office, I'm our public information specialist. So I help to put together all sorts of various public facing uh, documents, our website. I've also worked very closely to help set up the enhanced ballot system that we are now using for accessible vote by mail solution to our voters. Uh, so I've been with this office for a couple of years. I've also worked with the Florida Department of State Division of elections for around a decade, where I helped to put together various publications and training manuals for serving voters with disabilities. And just wanted to say thank you very much for the opportunity to speak uh, at this event. Thank you so much. Who's up next? I'll introduce myself. This is Brian Finney. I'm president and founder of Democracy Live. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to join Access the Vote Florida. What an important uh, seminar and conference you're having here. Uh, Democracy Live launched the first accessible vote by mail solution back in 2008. And since then, it's been deployed in nearly 2,500 jurisdictions across 29 states uh, in the United States over the last decade or so. And um, we're just thrilled and honored to support a lot of the jurisdictions in, in Florida. And again, I'm looking forward to listening and learning from the panelists and the conversation here today. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so to begin, I will ask the panelists to give us a little bit, a little knowledge when it comes to your experience with the access to vote by mail system. Would you like to give So this last election is the first time it was in August that I did use the accessible vote by mail. Um, it was a little challenging at first as I went onto my county website and find no information about accessible vote by mail. Then I called and I had to be transferred to one or two people. And then they said, yes, we will be sending you a link. Um, and it was Democracy Live that I used. So I eventually did get the link and was able to use that to vote, which was a really great experience. Thank you for sharing. Does anyone else have any experience or knowledge? Good morning. This is Doug Hall. I finally got my, my microphone, so I'm speaking. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Okay, I want to introduce myself. Sorry, I couldn't get my mic to come in before. Uh, my name is Doug Hall. I'm a white male. Um, I am blind. I'm age 74, soon to be 75. I'm a member of the Florida Council of the Blind. Actually, I chair its access committee. We were involved as consumers. We were involved in 2020 in forcing the state of Florida to certify the Democracy Live system. Uh, also, in with with our wonderful supervisor election in Volusia County, we were able to we were one of the five pilot counties. We were able to implement accessible vote by mail in the 2020 November election. Uh, oh, Great, thank you so much Maryland's, for Maryland's have Maryland's having trouble getting in too. <laughs> Okay. Um, whenever Marilyn's able to um, jump on and introduce herself, um, she can feel free to just interrupt us and um, let us know that she's ready. Okay. Um, until then, we can move on to the next question. Doug, thank you so much for introducing yourself. Sure. Um, sure. Did you have a response for your experience voting? 
Um, I started out in terms of uh, voting back in the 90s. Nancy and I worked to uh, to get accessible equipment at every polling place in the state of Florida. And I voted with that um, until 2020 when we were able to do accessible vote. Uh, thanks to Brian Finney and Democracy Live um, and our supervisor elections, we were able to implement the Omni system in Daytona, uh, in Volusia County. I was able to use that to vote completely independently and secretly or privately, which is something that was not being done before. So I guess you could say in terms of experience, I've been involved with the voting process, especially accessible vote by mail since the beginning when we were pushing to do that back in 2020. Well, thank you. So my question is for Aaron, when it comes to the accessible vote by mail system and its experience and issues, who should voters contact um, and what should they expect from the supervisors of election or even the technology that they're using? Yeah, thank you for the question. We um, There's a couple of things to expect if there are questions or issues, um, realizing that throughout the process, you may have a question about the procedure to how to return your ballot, what is available to you, how, um, you know, how you're going to receive the envelopes for returning your ballot. Uh, you may have a technical question. And so there are two different paths typically for that. If you have a procedural question about you know, when the ballot will be available or how to return it, uh, typically the best point of contact will be your supervisor of elections, um, contacting them directly, getting that answer from them. If you have a technical issue or an issue with your access technology or whatnot, uh, we encourage you to contact us um, or your supervisor. Both of us can address that for you. Uh, if you contact us, our email address is team at enhancedvoting.com and we will respond to you and get and engage with you and uh, address any of your concerns that you have with using your access technology uh, to get the ballot download and return it. Uh, we will often loop in your supervisor of elections just so they're aware of what uh, conversations we're having with one of their voters. Uh, so if you do contact us directly, please include your name, your county, so we know which county you're emailing us from, and, uh, and we'll be happy to assist you. Most of the questions, though, that we uh, been engaged with through the primary, uh, which was the first election uh, that we were used in the 41 counties uh, that we're in in Florida. Most of the questions were around procedural questions that the supervisors were able to to address directly. Thank you for sharing, Juliet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, did we have any other responses to that question on Zoom? If you have any problems um, trying to vote. Hey, this is Alex with the Leon County Supervisor of Elections Office. I would just really want to stress that I think the most important point of contact for a voter would really be their local Supervisor of Elections Office. We absolutely would love to receive more questions and more contact from voters that have any questions or concerns. Uh, we are available you know, during regular business hours to answer any of those things, and then obviously extended hours as we get really close to election day on election day itself. Um, on here in our county, since we're a medium sized county here in Leon, we have like dedicated vote by mail staff that are able to answer those particular questions as well, and then serve as a conduit as needed to the technolo technology that may be being used, whether at the enhanced ballot or another solution that the county can use. And I think that that is a pretty key point that needs to be shared is the experience for the voter is gonna be a little bit different depending upon their county because different counties may be using different solutions to, for, to provide accessible voting. And then the resources available in each county are gonna differ a little bit just based upon size, experience, expertise levels. So I think that, that using that local point of contact, the local county supervisor of elections office is going to be your best bet. Thank you for sharing. And you mentioned how the voting process might look a little different depending on the county. So my, my next question is everyone, um, how will universal design come into play when it comes to making accessible vote by mail um, a more comprehensive, a more comprehensive, um, 
more accessible. Than you. you say no to lost the spotlight on? Um, I would say if there would be information on the websites of the SOE's offices and to be able to find it in the CERT, that would be a really good start and to have information on the process and even on how to sign the envelope. Once I did get my email link to vote, it did explain all of that. But I think it's just a good reminder. I do know one person who actually still had an issue and had to was able to do the voting um, quick and easy. But when it came to signing the envelope, she still kind of had issues and had to use an app called um, Be My Eyes to do that. This is Marilyn Baldwin. Can you hear me? Yes, Marilyn. Hi, Marilyn. Thank you okay. so much for joining. I can hear you. Very good. I am from Central Florida, and I'm a member of Access the Vote Florida, and I'm also a member of the League of Women Voters of Orange County. I'm very glad that the previous speaker before, um, Marsha, brought up the importance of contact with the Supervisor of Elections Office. And last week, in honor of Disability Voting Rights Week, our Supervisor of Elections Office and the Center for Independent Living partnered together at the SCOE's office to provide training on our machines and how you can also vote by mail. I think that was an invaluable tool and I encourage others to do the same. Great, thank you so much. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the next question. Um, how do you think that ballot return options could be made more accessible? Um, I know that Marsha mentioned um, signing the back of it. Does anyone else have any ideas? That's a very, this is Doug Hall. That is a very good point. Um, number one, I, and I'm sure Brian's going to speak to this himself, but um, yes, there are problems with the current AVB, um, AVBM system where you have to sign the, ballot, the uh, envelope. I know our supervisor has indicated in her direction, she put a sticker to the left of where you need to sign your name. So that, that helps out quite a bit. Um, the person calls the, 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 the elections office and uh, indicates they would like the, the accessible ballot then the, the elections office sends that person the link that they can go and download the accessible ballot, accessible ballot and fill it out. Now, the problem is that right now in the state of Florida, and this is a, it speaks to your thing, right now in the state of Florida, it has to be on paper. So therefore, AVBM is fine, but right now you have to print the completed ballot and then mail it or put it in a Dropbox. That's a problem. Number one, a lot of people don't have printers. So what do you do? Uh, we, are, we are advocating that the state of Florida accept electronic return that would enable the person to electronically return their completed ballot. And that's something we are working for. Thanks, Doug. This, this is Brian Finney. Um, and you're absolutely right. The, the electronic uh, delivery of the ballot is a very significant first step and would have only happened because of local advocacy in the state of Florida. Uh, Doug and, and, and Nancy and, and all of uh, Access to Vote Florida and the Council of the Blind worked so hard to get that first key uh, step of, of accessible vote by mail and ballot marking delivered to all voters with disabilities. And as an earlier speaker mentioned, being able to reach out to your state and all or reach out to your local elections uh, uh, county and asking to be uh, to have access to the accessible vote by mail ballot is the first step. And so what you're going to want to do is reach out every six all 67 counties in Florida offer now accessible uh, vote by mail as what we call a one way ballot delivery. But as Doug mentioned, you will need to have a printer, at least for now. Um, one of the fastest growing technologies throughout the country right now is electronic return of the ballot. Um, I believe that we have close to 
10 states have deployed uh, electronic return um, across the country. So it is happening right now. Um, accessible vote by mail has been uh, now deployed in, in uh, you know, over half the states. But now we have a growing number of states that are offering electronic return of the ballot. So you don't have to have a printer. Uh, the most recent one was the state of Massachusetts, but just up the street from you all, we have you know, South Carolina and Alabama and North Carolina, they offer electronic return. Um, and as an important talking point in Florida, electronic return is already happening for military and overseas, but it's in the form of a fax machine. And, and so I think we can all do better than that, um, working collectively to make sure that full and equal access to voting is a reality, including uh, electronic return. So you're not required to have to have a printer. It may take a while to get there in, in Florida, but it is happening. And I think working collectively like you did already to get accessible vote by mail uh, going in Florida, the next step now is to eliminate the requirement for a printer. And that can happen with your advocacy. Wow, thank you for your response. Do any of the other panelists? Oh, I, you know, I wanted to say too, I was gonna bring up about the printer, but they already did. Um, but I would really like to see it going forward too, that it's not just for those of us who are print impaired, that anyone who votes by mail can do the electronic option. And that way, I think people, again, you know, cared about the mail system or where you have to drop it off. And that's an issue for those of us, especially if we do have to put it in a mailbox because we can't, we'd have to get transportation to go to a drop box in that, and there aren't as many mailboxes around either. So I think if we could move forward to have the electronic, you know, submitting your ballot for every voter, not just those that are print impaired. Uh, this is uh, Alex Mosca, and I really wanted to, to build on this, this conversation we're developing here. I think there's been some great um, topics already raised on this, this subject. But I think that there's a, some important components that really need to be considered when we're talking about um, in further expanding the use of uh, enhanced ballot or similar accessible technology for voting by mail. Um, and that is the, the balance that we need to have between accessibility, which is a great thing, but also security. Um, though talking about the re return of an electronic ballot uh, from the perspective of the supervisor of elections office does raise a lot of concerns when it comes to security. Um, a fully electronic ballot, one that did not have a paper component at all, uh, that would be sent entirely by like an email PDF return, raises a lot of potential security concerns uh, for ensuring that that ballot is in fact recorded as the voter intended it and is coming from that actual voter. Uh, under Florida law right now, all voting is ultimately done by paper. So even uh, the physical, the electronic ballot delivery, which is done through enhanced ballot or other accessible system, the vote, the return of that ballot does have to be printed out. And that's the same requirement that exists for uh, the special options for military and overseas voters who can get a ballot electronically, but they have to print it and then fax it back. And, and that, that paper component, the transition of the ballot from being an electronic thing to being a physical entity that has to be returned is a pretty important safeguard that exists within our system. Um, and I don't say this just to try to like dampen down spirits because I do think that there are options and availabilities that are there, but there's always going to be a trade-off between accessibility and security. And we need to keep that security component in mind as well as we're discussing these things. Um, it's just, it's, it's a pretty complicated game. Wow, thank you. So to and on that conversation, Aaron, are you willing to share any stigma when it comes to the election security and election accessibility? Yeah, so I want to kind of speak to a lot of what Alex mentioned and, and even before him. There is a tension between security and accessibility, uh, but it doesn't have always be a trade-off between one or the other. There is a new, There are new approaches, and we are embracing those at Enhanced Voting uh, to have both a ballot delivery and return 
but also the same level of verification that your ballot was properly returned to the election office and counted. And so that is sort of the bar that we need to establish is not only do we need to have an accessible ballot return option for voters who have um, who do not have printers or do not have the capability to, to um, sign an envelope uh, or difficulties with that, uh, we not only need to hit that bar from the accessibility side, but we need to be able to, as much as possible, match the same level of assurances we have with paper from a security perspective. And there are approaches to do this, and they're not trivial. They're very complex and, and um, intensive from a development and, and um, implementation perspective, but they do exist, and we're investing in that approach. And that's the, uh, that's the idea that when and if it becomes an option here in Florida, we will uh, be able to have verifiable electronic return. This is Doug Hall. I find the, the comments interesting. As a blind person who started voting um, when I wasn't allowed to vote through the systems, every time there's a change, there are fears that are brought up about a problem that may happen in terms of change. I, instead of being afraid of what's happening, I think we need to look into finding out what we need to do to make it so it's not a problem instead of fearing it and denying change because we're afraid. This is Marilyn, and I concur with what Doug is saying, and I call upon people with disabilities and people without disabilities to be fully committed to ensuring that every person with a disability has the right to vote and that we don't allow any obstacles to stand in our way. I am legally blind with limited vision, and I also sometimes have mobility issues. Voting is our right, so we have got to make this a number one priority without any limits. Great, thank you so much. Those were some responses. Um, and I think it's giving all of us a lot to think about. Um, going off of what some of you have mentioned already, um, how to, uh, I would like to talk more about um, the electronic process um, and how can that involve people with disabilities and also um, people that may not have disabilities but may live overseas or maybe um, in the military or those sorts of things. How can finding um, a secure way to do this really um, benefit everyone, including people with disabilities? This is Doug again. Interesting question. Before we discuss it, I think one of the things that I need to mention is you know, we're talking about printers, we're talking about electronic return, but one of the things we need to look at is accessible vote by mail is fine, but you know, we are denying people that don't have computer and, and cell phone access the ability to use the system. And that's something we may want to look at fixing as well. There are a number of issues that we need to look at. Now, in terms of your, your other point, um, you know, there are questions about electronic return. I realize that, but we need to do it. We need to look at what we need to, to make it accessible. You know, I find it interesting. Brian was commenting that it's being done elsewhere with no problem. If there's no problem in the many states that are already doing it, why do we have a problem here in Florida other than the, than we're complaining that that might be not secure. Great, and if anyone else would like to um, discuss that or discuss the ballot return options, um, in, whether that be electronic or drop boxes, if anyone else has any comments regarding those. I think that the, there's some really great points that have been raised and the need, this is Alex with the Supervisor of Elections Office again, uh, and the need to, to balance and thread that needle between accessibility and security, that, that balance there, and finding ways which can be the times mutually beneficial for both. Um, and it's important to, um, to acknowledge also the limitations or the constraints that exist within our current system as well. Like as a Supervisor of Elections Office, uh, we we don't get to we are constrained by the laws that exist on the books right now in Florida, and one of those requirements is that all voting is done using a paper ballot. So even if there was a a system which was secure, 
uh, which may be in use in other states to allow for electronic, fully electronic return of a ballot. We here at the Leon County Supervisor of Elections Office, we wouldn't be allowed to, to use that system and provide it to our voters uh, under current Florida law. We have to follow those requirements that are in law right now. Um, of course, it's, it's not to say that those laws can't change. Uh, laws can absolutely change uh, with, with advocacy, with you know, petitioning the legislature to have those changes occur. But the, we have to operate as from our office, operate within the, the system that currently exists and then maximize that as far as we possibly can to the benefit of our voters uh, with disabilities and removing the barriers that we, uh, we can. This is Marilyn. I understand exactly what you're saying. And I think it's incumbent upon us in the disability community through organizations like the National Federation of the Blind, of which I'm a member, the American Council for the Blind and other organizations to use our advocacy power to help to legally bring about these changes through our state legislature or we are going to be left behind here in Florida when it comes to accessible voting. Thank you for your comments. Do any of the panelists have any suggestions when it comes to making voting more accessible or even talking about the differences between the accessible vote by mail processes in different states and how that can be implemented within our process? This is Doug Hall. I wanna make a political comment that that yes, it's important and Alex is correct. We can't do a thing until the legislature decides it's okay. Once they say it's okay, which I know they will eventually, things change. But, one, but in the meantime, what we need to do as advocates, we need to speak to our representatives and educate them because they really don't have any idea of what's important. They're, they're, based, they're basing their decisions on what they hear from their constituents and other people. I think it, it, it is important that we as advocates speak to the representatives and educate them about the need to make changes. Uh, that's, that speaks to anything. We need to educate our legislators if we want them to do what we feel is needed. Um, in addition to that, I think it's very important that all consumers speak to their supervisor of elections offices to indicate they want accessible voting. Because I'm hearing, um, I'm hearing from a lot of supervisors that no one's calling. Why should I do anything if nobody's interested? And it's, it's an old story that we have. Unless we are out there and advocate, it's not going to happen. This is Marcia, and I think too, but we do need to also get the supervisors of elections to have information on their website, to have information out there, even if it's, you know, the, uh, I don't know, Facebook or social media. Yes, accessible vote by mail is available in your county. Call, call your supervisor of election. It's a lot of people don't know about it or they're just so used to either not voting or going to the polls and not having a be set up that's accessible, or they still, and they have a choice if they do want someone to help them. I personally don't, I wanna independently and privately vote like I have a right to do. But I think again, the communication of getting it out there needs to come from both the SOE's offices and from the disability community. This is Doug again. Thank you, Marsha, for your comment. I think one of the important things we need to keep in mind is that the general public have the right to vote either at the poll or vote by absentee ballot. That's their right. I feel as a person with disabilities, I should have the same right to make a choice whether I want to go to the polling vote or if I want to vote through an accessible vote by mail. It's not a question of security. It's not a question of accessibility. It's a question of, of it's a question of our right to be able to vote the way we want to vote. 
I, I would, uh, yeah. I agree completely about the need for, for outreach. Um, I think that's a really, really key point. From our perspective at a supervisor of elections office, uh, we don't know who the voters are that could benefit from this system. You know, we don't have a database that says, here are 500 voters in Leon County who have low vision. That's not a resource that we have access to. Um, but what we can utilize and what benefits us so much is these connections with organizations such as Disability Rights Florida, such as the Centers for Independent Living, such as uh, in Leon County, we have the Lighthouse of the Big Bend that is a dis advocate and support organization for uh, individuals with blindness and low vision. Those partnerships are key because those are our bridges to those voters who have those disabilities and who would benefit from these systems. And we would absolutely love to get more calls, more questions, more utilization of the um, of these systems. You know, we, we want people to vote. We want to remove those barriers wherever we possibly can. Um, here in Leon County, we we're doing those outreach efforts to our, those local organizations. When we um, started using uh, enhanced ballot, this is our first election cycle with it. You know, we sent out a press release. Uh, to all of our media partners to get the word out about it. Uh, and we going to um, do some events in our community to, to advocate for utilization of this system. And we're really hoping to see more, uh, more voters using this as time goes on. We would love to see that. Um, I would like to share some usage statistics from for a little brief little bit of some numbers from what it looked like in the primary election. Uh, in Leon County, we have around 200,000 voters. Uh, in the primary election, we had 10 voters request use of the accessible vote by mail system. And I believe we had one voter actually return an accessible ballot through that system. And I would love to see those numbers be fantastically higher in the general election and in elections to follow. Great. This is Brian. Uh, oh, go ahead. I'll just chime in briefly on on uh, what we've experienced. You mentioned we did have been doing uh, accessible vote by mail since 2008, and what we've seen around the country is a snowball effect. It will start, you know, fairly small at first, but then with education, with outreach, much like what Nancy and, and Doug have done in Volusia, and, and it sounds like what is happening up in Leon County. You know, that education is such an important element to this, to be able to spread the word either through social or through PR releases, leaning in to the accessibility community to really educate that that opportunity to vote an accessible um, ballot is available to them. And I think what you'll see is it starts off with maybe a handful of voters, but then it's it doubles and then it doubles again. And it really starts to snowball over time. But again, it does take education. It does take outreach. It does take the, the, the community coming together between the supervisors as well as the disability community to inform the community that it's available. But there is hope, it will continue to grow. Great, thank you so much. Um, I would like to uh, pose a question um, going off of that, speaking of outreach and bringing people together in order to improve accessibility of voting. Um, has anyone seen any ways that this has happened where um, maybe you can um, talk about an experience where the disability advocates um, were able to come together with the legislature or bring other advocates along with them? Where have you seen success in your advocacy and where have you seen success and change to make voting more accessible? This is Doug. Interesting question. Uh, two two answers I have. Number one, in terms of outreach, in terms of educating, one of the things we did here last uh, in 2020 is that with the assistance of our supervisor, we actually had uh, a mock election. What before we before the thing ever started, we had a mock election that was promoted by our supervisor elections, so that people were able to actually use the system to see how it worked. And there was a lot of discussion based on that. Um, some, a lot of people tried it, but there was a lot of conversation based on that of how it worked and problems they had. And we were able to fix a lot of those problems. Um, second thing I want to comment in terms of legislators, 
one of the things I think we need to do and we have done here is to contact the policymakers, the officials to educate them about what is needed. Because frankly, and this was mentioned to me by uh, members of our county council here that they don't know uh, they base their decisions on what pressure, what advice, what information they are given. It's up to us to educate them to indicate why it's important. Okay. Thank you for your response. And so the last question for today would be for all panelists. And the question is, what would you consider the work undone when it comes to accessible vote? Yeah, this is Aaron. I think there's a couple of things and I'll just mention them. You know, one is consistent communication as was mentioned by several other panelists. I think, you know, each independent supervisor of elections, uh, you know, pushed out the information in the means they had, but I think some consistency in that uh, so the voters across the state, wherever you live, have the availability uh, of that information and how to get access to that system. And so if you're in a county that doesn't have that information on the website or whatnot, please contact your, your supervisor to, uh, to get information, at least on the website, and find out how to uh, access the ballot uh, in your county. Uh, but then the other one is this electronic return, and not only accessible electronic return, but also electronic return that when you submit your ballot to an electronic system, that you can verify that that electronic system properly processed it, kept your ballot private to you, uh, and uh, kept it uh, full, you know, kept its integrity throughout the return process. Those are the, the steps to uh, tackle next. Great, this thanks. is Marilyn. Um, two, hey, two tools, two tools. Um, Access the Vote Florida has an excellent website where people with disabilities can go and find out information about voting and candidates, et cetera. And the League of Women Voters has a tool online called Vote 411. And there's a wealth of information there. It can help you register, et cetera. Great, thank you so much. We're gonna move on to some questions that we have. I'm gonna um, transition into the Q&A section of our panel. Um, so we have some, uh, the first couple of questions we have are from our in-person crowd. Um, the first one is, what are you planning to do to provide accessible vote by mail slash remote voting for voters who do not use a computer? So one of the options there is gonna be telephone voting. So it's something that when electronic return is uh, legal here in the state, that hopefully telephone voting will also be legal in the state and we'll be able to provide that. Great, thanks so much. Our second question is, I'm concerned about the security of vote by mail systems. How do I know that my ballot has not been covered with when I find, when I fill it out with one of these systems? Um, I'm, is, go ahead. Okay, um, well, I'm happy to, to speak about that uh, because I've literally gone through that entire process. In addition to, um, providing information about vote by mail systems, I am responsible for the counting of vote by mail ballots in Leon County. So when we came across this um, a returned accessible vote by mail ballot, it's my responsibility to ensure that that ballot and those votes that are on it are recorded as the voter marked it. Um, the entire process for for tabulating, for counting that ballot, it's called tabulation, is done in an open and accessible meeting space. So anyone can, can come into a public meeting to watch us go through that process of counting that ballot. Uh, and we have advocates from the political parties, from candidates, whoever wants members of the public, members of the media, they can show up and watch this process occur entirely in, in a public setting. Um, we test our equipment in advance, again, in a public setting to ensure that the machines are counting the vote as marked by the voter. And then if a ballot needs to be, um, it's called recreated because some ballots that we receive become physically damaged in the mail or like a fax ballot that's returned, we can't 
put that through our voting equipment directly because it's not in the exact like right paper size and such. We'll copy the marks from that the voter put on their ballot onto a duplicate ballot that can go through the equipment. And that whole process is done, again, accessible, open, uh, public meeting, anyone can observe that process uh, and they do. And we that's how we ensure that that vote and though the voters ballot is recorded as intended by the voter through transparency and accessibility. I was also going to say too, you can also just like with regular mail and ballot go online to make sure they received it and that it's going to, you know, there's not a problem with it, um, your signature, or whatever too. Great. Thank you so much. And um, now we're going to check in with our online participants. Um, so De Palma, do we have any questions in the chat? Thanks, Juliet. Um, so this is Tony De Palma. And a question we have from Terry in the chat, who notes that they're very lucky to be just one mile away from their in polling or in person polling precinct is what are the data points being evaluated to determine the need for accessible vote by mail balloting? Is it the request number? Uh, itself, or is it the participation overall? Um, I know Alex had spoken a little bit to this, but we're just wondering what are the data points upon which this program will grow? Um, well, for, from our perspective, uh, it's a requirement that we provide it. So we will provide it even if there's one voter that uses the system, that's great. And we've fulfilled that need to remove that barrier for that one voter. Uh, if there are a hundred voters or a thousand voters that are using it, that's even better. But ultimately, we, we will uh, provide an accessible vote by mail option to the voters of our county, as will every county in the state of Florida for their voters as well. Um, that is part of what we do. Thank Just you, Alex. This is Doug. Um, you, you made a good point there. If it, if it assists one person, then it is worthwhile as far as I'm concerned. Agreed. Important. Uh, research came out last year. This is Brian Finney uh, from Rutgers University, and they highlighted that there's, and an, for those of you in this conference probably know far better than, than I would, but from the study from Rutgers University, it mentioned that there were 38 million voters with disabilities, 16% uh, of the voting population, which is the largest minority you know, subset of voters um, in the country. For, for the, the voting population. So the data point is 16% of voters, uh, many of whom cannot see or hold or mark a paper ballot independently and privately. So there's a, there's a large population out there that, uh, you know, I know that Aaron and Democracy Live, we're trying to work to provide the tools and the technologies to expand access to the vote to those voters. Uh, it's a significant population that need to be served. Are there any other questions? Hi, Juliet. This is Tony De Palma again, uh, the chat moderator. Um, we've had a request that uh, moderators and panelists and audience uh, identify themselves when they're speaking and there's a change of speaker. So I was just tossing that out. And then Damien asks, uh, do any of the panelists or organizations have a toolkit that can be used to educate voters about accessible voting and accessible vote by mail? Hi, this is Alex in, in Leon County. Uh, and yes, we do have a toolkit. We, we put something together. It's a informational guide that explains what enhanced voting, uh, the enhanced voting option is in Leon County, how voters can sign up for it and what their experience would be like to vote that ballot and then return that ballot. Uh, and that was a key point when we started using enhanced voting, uh, enhanced ballot was we need to be able to answer questions and we need to give people the information that they need if they want to use this system. So we put that together and we're, we're glad that we did so and we shared it with advocacy organizations in our community to help get the word out about this system. This is Marcia and Alex, I've got a question for you. So when you do that kind of thing, do you share those kind of things with the other SOE's offices? Are there times that you meet together? you share those type of ideas and thoughts? Uh, in general, yes, there's a lot of cross collaboration that goes on with supervisors of elections offices. There's a, a state association that uh, holds trainings and panels and events very similar to, to what this panel is uh, right now. Um, uh, 
And yes, so that, that does occur. Regarding this specific document, uh, I don't know uh, off the top of my head, but in general, yes. And this is a great opportunity for, for growth uh, as we move forward. Yeah, and this is Aaron with Enhanced Voting. I'll just add, we have a, a template that we give to our counties that they can customize to their county and their contact information and, and you know, tailor it to uh, to their county that explains the process, explains how to use our system. Uh, we have a generic version of that website, um, and it's generic uh, nationwide because we don't know where folks are coming from. Uh, the better one is the one that the counties would customize from our template. Okay, we are going to break here, if that's okay, um, just to try to get us back on, on track with our time. Uh, I'd like to thank our uh, panelists for uh, this particular panel, as well as Juliet and Chris. Thank you so much. And I'd like to also ask the um, panelists from panel number two to come forward to the tables while I introduce uh, the next panel. So our next panel is titled, Nothing About Us Without Us, Under the disability vote. We have gathered national and state level voting analysts and experts to discuss historical and current voting perspectives, the current state and national legislative landscape, how people with disabilities have traditionally voted, and what the future of the disability vote may look like. Moderating this panel is Caitlin Clinton, who is a public policy analyst with Disability Rights Florida and a member of Access the Vote Florida. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, as Robin said, I am Caitlin Clippen. I'm a public policy analyst with Disability Rights Florida. I'm super excited to be here for this conversation today. Um, first, I will just ask our panelists to um, really introduce themselves. I'll start out with the folks in the room. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Thank you for having me. My name is Keith, and I am the program director for Common Cause Florida. And my work focuses on frontline and grassroots election and voter protection, helping with the, to make sure that everybody who engages with the voting process is able to cast a ballot that counts. That's a lot of voter education work, combating this and disinformation, um, a lot of um, coordination across like-minded organizations, as well as advocacy to improve practice at the county level, and a lot of mobilization and training for volunteers so that they can support fellow voters in their communities. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Whoa, it's loud. My name is Brad Ashwell. I'm the state director for All Voting is Local. Uh, we work to eliminate discriminatory barriers to, val uh, to the ballot, to voting um, that impacts Black and Hispanic voters or voters with disabilities. Um, we do a lot of work at the local level with supervisors of elections. We also do a lot of work with um, the legislature, try, you know, often fighting back uh, bills that restrict access, but also working on policies that improve access. Thank you. Um, next, I'll ask um, some of our online panelists to introduce themselves. I believe we have Michelle Bishop with us. Hi, yes, thank you so much for having me this morning. My name is Michelle Bishop. I am the Voter Access and Engagement Manager at NDRN, the National Disability Rights Network. We are based in Washington, DC, but we are actually the membership association nationally for organizations like Disability Rights Florida that exist all over the country. I will say first, I'm so sorry that I couldn't make it live to Florida today, but secondly, that you all will be thankful for that because if you can't tell, I'm actually sick right now. So I think you guys dodged a bullet. You didn't have to sit in a room with me today. Thanks, Michelle. I hope you feel better soon. Um, next, I'll ask Michelle Cantor Cohen to introduce herself. We may have a, a slight problem with that. So I'm gonna skip and ask Doug Cruz to introduce himself. Hello there, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Doug Cruz, I'm a professor at Rutgers University. Um, I do a lot of work uh, with my colleague, Lisa Schur, also a professor at Rutgers University. She's traveling overseas right now or she would be happy to be here as well. Uh, we, we do a lot of work together on analyzing uh, disability uh, and voting. 
uh, looking both at turnout trends and at the difficulties faced by people with disabilities. We have uh, uh, some of uh, the surveys we've done have been uh, funded by, have been sponsored by the US Election Assistance Commission. And I'm very happy that we have Commissioner Hicks here today to, to join us and give us his, his insights as well. Thank you. Um, so with that, I'll ask um, Chairman Hicks to introduce himself. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> I'm uh, Tom Hicks, Chairman of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. I want to thank Access to um, Access to Vote Florida and the conference organizers for having me today. Um, pleased to talk about the EAC and all the work that we've done and uh, some of the surveys that Doug mentioned and other people on the last panel talked about. Um, again, I am sorry that I'm not able to be there today, um, and hopefully in the future we can all meet in person again. So, but thank you for having me, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Um, do we have Michelle Cantor Cohen on yet? Yes. Hi. Good morning. Um, this is Michelle Cantor Cohen. Um, I am the policy director and senior counsel at Fair Election Center based in DC. Um, I'm also sorry I can't be there in person today in Florida, um, but look forward to meeting um, you know, many of you uh, going forward. Um, Fair Election Center is a nonpartisan nonprofit focused um, exclusively on the right to vote, on, on uh, bringing down barriers to the right to vote and making voting more um, accessible for um, historically marginalized people. Um, and I'm very honored and excited to be part of the panel today. Thank you so much. And um, we have some panelists, so I'm going to direct some questions specifically at certain folks. But if you, if anyone else wants to pipe in, please feel free to do so. Um, for, just to start off, I was hoping that some of our national folks, perhaps Michelle Bishop, could start out addressing um, national accessibility. So can you tell us how states differ as far as their accessible voting options? Oh, that's such a great question. This is Michelle, because it's uh, such a mixed bag in terms of what accessible voting looks like, depending on where you are all over the country. I, and I think one of the things we know is that very few of our election laws are actually federal laws. So much of how our elections are run are determined at the state and even at the local level. So what options are available to you as a voter with a disability in many ways depends on where you live. Uh, some states offer curbside voting, where if you can get to your polling place, but you can't get in because it's not accessible to you or for whatever reason, they'll bring the ballot to you on the curb. Uh, some have even, you know, kind of uh, turned that even to a full on drive through voting model, which is the same thing as curbside voting, it just processes them a little quicker. Uh, whether or not you're able to drop off a ballot in the drop box, which can be really important to voters who are not able to wait in line for an extended period of time. Uh, that ballot drop box can get you in and out of there in 10 minutes, even if the line is six hours long. Uh, that differs depending on your state or your county. Uh, whether or not you're able to, as we were talking about earlier this morning, receive your ballot electronically to vote by mail, mark it electronically, return it electronically. Uh, to make vote by mail more accessible differs from state to state. So it's actually really important to know wherever you are, what the options are that are available to you. And to be honest, um, I'm glad we have a lot of local elections officials present today because we stress to voters all the time, talk to your local elections office to make sure you know exactly what options are going to be available to you and whether or not your polling place is going to be accessible for you based on your disability. Uh, and really researching that information and making a plan to vote ahead of time because it it differs a lot and it's changed a lot since the 2020 election. We made a lot of changes to how we run our elections in 2020, not based on disability, based on COVID, based on the pandemic and people needing to socially distance, but I'll take it, guys. Like it wasn't done for voters with disabilities, but I'll take it because we made a lot of good decisions in 2020, like extending early voting, reducing barriers to vote by mail, like getting rid of witness signatures and extending the deadlines, um, expanding use of curbside voting, expanding use of ballot drop boxes. We saw an increase in electronic ballot delivery for vote by mail. Some of those core practices that can break down barriers for people with disabilities. And in some states, we're seeing those become permanent. And in some states, we're seeing pushback in the legislature on making those, those decisions more permanent. So 
really every state is a bit of a jumble of some good practices that make voting more accessible for everyone and some practices that I think create some barriers for people with disabilities. Thank you for that. And, and you did kind of touch on um, just over time, but I wanted to ask uh, Chair Hicks, um, could you talk to us about um, the, the uh, give us a perspective on the history of federal legislation around voting with a disability? Well, um, there's obviously the Americans with Disabilities Act, but I would say for voting purposes, um, the Help America Vote Act, which will turn 20, uh, next month uh, was the first time put in codification, uh, put in put into law, basically saying for people who have disabilities to be able to vote independently and privately. And that was a huge step forward. And I believe that that only came about because of advocates like yourselves um, to have that implemented into the legislation when when HABA was being talked about. Um, there are other as aspects to it, but um, I think that that's the major piece and, um, you know, for time, I want other folks to be able to answer as well. But are there are other panelists like to pipe in on that. Okay. Uh, uh, this, oh, go I'm ahead. Sorry. This is Michelle Cantor, Cohen at Fair Election Center. Um, uh, one other important uh, federal law on accessibility is the right to assistance. And obviously we've been talking um, about the right to vote privately and independently, but um, of course there um, is also a need for assistance. It's really important um, for people who, who need it. And um, the section 208 of the Voting Rights Act um, requires that people um, who um, need assistance um, for reason of their disability or um, inability to read and write in the language of the ballot um, be um, uh, able to choose almost anybody of their choice to assist them to vote. Um, it's pretty much anybody except for your employer or union rep. Um, and that's a, a really important right and something I can talk about also a little bit later in terms of some of the legislation that we've seen across the country. Um, uh, unfortunately, in some instances, really limiting that, um, that right, but that is a right that exists under a federal law for all elections. I want to jump in again and thank Michelle for reminding me of that because um, the EAC has done a great job in terms of um, having a small card that we have distributed over 25,000 in the last two years, which lays out what your rights are as a disability a disabled voter, uh, whether or not basically being able to vote independently and privately, being able to ask for assistance or being able to have whoever you want in the polling place with you other than your employer or union rep um, to to assist you with that and we distribute that card to anyone who would like to have it it's also available in braille and also available in large print as well thank you so much for that information um i wanted to switch gears now to state law um so for brad and amy sitting here with me can you talk to us about the current state laws, especially as they relate to drop boxes, signature matching, and ballot return. Yeah, yeah I guess I'll kick us off. Um, uh, so, yeah, I guess it's important to take a, a minute to backdrop for this. So in 2020, we had a pandemic, and by virtue of that, we saw um, voting rights expanded in a lot of ways. We saw vote by mail made more accessible. We saw early voting made more accessible, um, and there were a lot of improvements. And for us advocates, after 2020, a lot of um, our efforts were geared towards preserving those expansions and um, fighting back any attempts to restrict them and then new attempts to restrict the, the right to vote. Um, there was a lot of misinformation. I don't need to. I don't think I need to go into what that was um, flowing from the 2020 election and some of the candidates. And it led to a wave of um, bills across the country restricting um, methods of voting, particularly vote by mail. Um, in Florida, we saw restrictions to vote by mail in terms of an additional ID requirement on the um, vote by mail request form. The problem being that it, it required you to submit your driver's license, your state ID, or the last for your social security uh, number uh, and it required the supervisor of elections and our 
is to confirm the match, but um, not all of the supervisors have those three data points for every voter. So if you're a voter and you submitted your last for your social, but the supervisor has access to your driver's license, it wouldn't be a match. And then they had no requirement to even notify you that it didn't match. So it's just an unnecessary. I mean, they did it in the name of security, but it was another hurdle and it you know, definitely disproportionately impacts um, voters with disabilities who might not need a driver's license or might not have that ID uh, or might just get tripped up by um, another hurdle put in the process. Drop boxes uh, were another big issue. Um, you know, we, we required drop boxes at every early voting site in any space that could be an early voting site before the 2020 election cycle, but that was the first cycle we had it statewide. And it became this lightning, this absurd sort of lightning rod of an issue, but it was really effective. It gave uh, voters an, an, you know, a lot of options as far as where they could return their ballots, uh, the hours and return their ballots. And then we saw um, you know, restrictions to those both, you know, mainly because they created staffing requirements, which create cost, which then put supervisors in the position of having to decide you know, do I put another Dropbox here or not? And also they created penalties on supervisors of $20,000 if the Dropboxes aren't attended, uh, which further discouraged them. So we have seen a reduction in the Dropboxes um, and the hours are, are dialed back to, you know, we saw more counties doing 24 hour Dropboxes, not so much now. Um, I think the only other thing I'll say before I hand it off to give, there's plenty of other things, Amy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, one other thing uh, that's, you know, I think particularly of concern to voters with disabilities is voter assistance. They, um, in the name of um, fighting back against sort of a made up enemy ballot harvesting, which isn't really a problem, but they've um, restricted voter assistance to, so, so you can basically turn in your ballot immediate family members and two other people, two non-family members, um, which could have a lot of impacts to um, assisted living facilities and other folks who, who, you know, church leaders and other folks who be helping a lot of voters return their vote by mail ballots. Um, Amy? Yeah, I actually want to pick up right where you left off on the ballot return. This actually is one of the changes in the recent laws that most concerns me, both because of the disproportionate impact it has on people who need assistance returning their ballot, people with disabilities, older people, anyone who needs assistance returning their ballot, but also because of the chilling effect that it can have on voters supporting one another in general. We know that people rely on friends, neighbors, colleagues for voter information support with voting. And not only did the legislature limit who can assist somebody in return ballot, which, you know, going back to what Michelle was saying, voters have a right to the person of their choice to assist them. And now if the person of your choice has already returned friends ballots, they can't help you return yours. So they've limited who you can choose to help you return your ballot. On top of that, with 524, they criminalized this. They said that if you, they made it a felony to help too many of your friends and neighbors vote. And what kind of impact does that have chilling effect on who can assist and on voters supporting and assisting one another. So that, you know, this was, I think, really an attempt to quash efforts by faith communities, by other communities who were mobilizing and supporting their members to vote by mail. And it has caught up so many others in it to really have an impact on assisting voters, um, you know, having voters assist one another and, and communities helping people within their communities vote. And it's really concerning. I think another law which um, is important to mention, I think you had also asked about the signature matching. Um, so signature matching, uh, if you submit by mail ballot, of course you have to sign the ballot envelope and that has to match the signature that's on file. And if it doesn't match, you'll get notified and you have to submit an affidavit and a, or a photo or a scan of your ID. Now that is already a cumbersome process for anybody whose signature has changed over time, changes frequently. Um, so it's already a cumbersome process. It's already a process in which we know voters with disabilities are more likely to have their signatures flagged and have more challenge accessing those cure processes. But in the past, it was the supervisor of elections office staff who were the ones flagging a signature as a potential mismatch. Now, under our new laws, parties and candidates 
can appoint people to look at ballot envelopes and to flag signatures for potential mismatch. Um, they don't have to have any training, any qualifications, or any experience, but they can question another voter's signature on their ballot. And that really does create, you know, more that you have. Those take time. It takes time to contact voters. It takes time to review them. Um, and that could mean that it takes longer before people are getting notified. It can mean time to be able to cure that ballot and more voters, more voters with disabilities getting caught up in that and having to go through those cure processes. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very comprehensive. <laughs> um, does any, are, do any of our other panelists want to pipe in here about Florida law? If not, I was going to move um, and ask Doug to talk to us about the data. Um, can you tell us what some of the trends you've seen and the conclusions you've been able to draw about the disability community and voting? Um, and, and as you're talking about that, could you please add in um, any information? And tell us about the intersections of race, education, gender, you know, any of those types of other factors, how they play into the statistics. Sure, I'm glad to. Um, let me put this in a uh, let me put this in a good news, bad news framework. Um, I, I'm going to start with the uh, going to start with the bad news. Uh, for, first bit of bad news is, uh, and I think most of us realize this: people with disabilities continue to be less likely than people without disabilities to vote. That there's a stubborn turnout gap of about five to seven percentage points between people with and without disabilities. Um, the part of that seems to be due to, you know, there, there are several factors there, but part of that is due to the increased difficulties that people with disabilities face in voting. In, in survey, the 2020 survey we did, uh, sponsored by the EAC, um, we found that 11% uh, or one out of nine people with disabilities who voted experienced difficulties in doing that. And that rate was about twice as high as among people without disabilities, which is 6% for them. Um, so that's that's a significant factor. Another thing that plays into this is the, uh, and someone referred to this earlier, uh, the digital divide. Uh, the fact that people with disabilities are less likely to uh, use computers and internet and access the internet. We uh, found that people with disabilities are about three times as likely as people without disabilities to not have access to the internet. So that's the bad news. Uh, the good news is that there was a surge in turnout among people with disabilities in 2018 and 2020 uh, with the general population. In fact, the, uh, uh, the, the surge among people with disabilities in 2020 was slightly larger on a percentage basis than among people without disabilities. Uh, just in terms of pure numbers, the, uh, there, there were 1.7 million more voters with disabilities in 2020 than there were in 2016. That's, that's a big increase. Um, a, a, a factor in this, I think, is the, that the difficulties in voting do seem to be coming down. As I said, the, uh, there, there was 11% of people of voters with disabilities who had problems in 2020. We did the survey in 2012, and at that point it was 26% who had difficulties. So there was a dramatic decrease in uh, the difficulties faced by people with disabilities. Um, the, the last thing I'll just point to that makes me hopeful is that the turnout seemed to come up especially among young people with disabilities. The, between 2016 and 2020, the, the increase um, uh, was much higher among young people with disabilities than among older people with disabilities. That is the, the disability gap was narrowing a lot more for the young people with disabilities. So that's a, uh, well, I think obviously that's a very hopeful sign for the future. Oh, and, and I'm sorry, you wanted me to talk about the uh, intersections, the, uh, the uh, intersection, I, I just referred to the intersection with age there. Um, with regard to um, race and gender uh, and ethnicity, we, we see those gaps exist within, the, the disability gaps exist within each of those within each of those groups, um, which means that, you know, in some sense, the, uh, the effects are additive. That, for example, uh, people who are Hispanic or Latino are less likely to vote than the rest of the population, and disability uh, adds to that. The, the, 
Hispanics or Latinos with disabilities um, uh, who, who have disabilities are, 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 are especially unlikely to vote. So we don't see a lot of differences in the gaps within those groups. That is, you know, men and women are both with disabilities are both less likely to vote than men and women without disabilities. Um, as I say, the effects seem to be to be additive. Um, I'm glad to talk more about that if anyone has if anyone has questions. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I did just want to remind everyone for folks in the room, um, if you want to write questions on your index cards, don't forget you can do that. Um, and also for folks online, uh, feel free to use the chat and we'll do some questions at the end. Um, so in light of what Doug just said, I wanted to open this up to any or all of our panelists and ask about the importance of understanding, you know, the data, the stats that, that Doug just talked about. What is the value of understanding marginalized communities' votes, um, especially the disability community? Well, I think this is Tom Hicks. Um, I think one of the most important things to talk about and to, to clarify is to say, we needed that data. And so the the EAC commissioners actually approved the funding of that with Rutgers University um, to, to get that data because we felt that it was very important to know. And so I think that once you know that, then you can make improvements to the process. And so now that we have that data, how can we take that back to uh, decision makers to say, hey, how can we improve the process? Um, how do we ensure that those who have problems actually casting their vote um, no longer have those barriers in place? And yes, it's improved since 2012, but it's, we're still not at the point where we should be. Um, we've made great strides with technology. We've made great strides with some uh, additional uh, barriers being taken down, but we're still not where we should be. This is Michelle Bishop. I have to just agree quickly with Tom because I think we also have data from Pew Research Center that says that people with disabilities were more likely to report that they felt who wins an election really matters, that they're paying close attention to the results. So I think we have data that says that people with disabilities know how important elections are and they care. Uh, and they understand that their elected officials have a real impact on their lives. So if what we see from Doug's research is that our voter participation lags behind non-disabled people. It's not because we're not interested. It's not because we're not paying attention. It's because there are barriers that are preventing our participation uh, that I think are well-documented by Doug's research as well. So I think really when we look at the data collectively, what we understand is that people with disabilities are as invested in our democracy as anyone else, but we've put up such a great number of barriers to that participation that there are people who are trying to cast their ballots and are unable or people who have attempted to cast their ballots unsuccessfully so many times they maybe didn't come back anymore and I think something that Doug pointed out that's also really important is that we saw an increase in voter participation of people with disabilities coincidentally when we made elections more accessible in recent history so I, I think that right there drives the point home that these barriers actually do make a difference in who's having their voices heard on election day i'll just add a, a note here that uh, as michelle said the you know the survey data we have show that people with disabilities are just as interested in elections as people without disabilities, there's there's no uh, there's no enthusiasm gap. There seem to be other barriers that uh, help that prevent people from with disabilities from voting. But an important point I wanted to note here is that, um, interestingly, um, you know, people with disabilities, as I said, are just as invested in voting. The the partisan split is not very different. Um, in fact, it, it it looks like people with disabilities are just as likely to be Republicans or Democrats as the rest of the population. And I think that's an important point. It, it's, it's an interesting point, um, the, the, but I think it's very important as well because both Republicans and Democrats, everyone across the political spectrum has interest in turning out people with disabilities. This is not a partisan issue. And I think that's a, 
um, very important point to make in uh, in encouraging encouraging and enabling everyone to vote. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And so, you know, having talked about about that to um, ask for some concrete suggestions, um, I'd love to hear from all of the panelists on this question, but I'm going to start with Michelle Cohen, um, since we haven't heard from you in a minute. Um, can you please give us any suggestions you might have for improvements to our federal law or state law um, that that would help increase access? Sure, and I think I'll, I'll start with state law since that's where, um, and this is Michelle Kinter going, um, this, that's where so many of the, the changes really are, um, you know, that's what we're seeing right now is where places that are, um, are experiencing changes and where we can make changes. First of all, I mean, I, um, this should go without saying, but states need to stop limiting the right to assistance under a federal law and conflicting with the federal rights. Um, just, just that just needs to stop. Um, that, but, but states should also go further than that, right? I mean, it's this. The federal laws are a minimum. Um, that's um, uh, just a starting place. Um, I, you know, one thing to go back to signature matching for a moment. I wanted to uh, talk about a few reasons why signature matching is so problematic. In addition to the lack of training, um, it's inherently problematic for people whose signatures change over time. That includes people whose um, writing ability changes over time. It also, um, you know, if you're using um, just technology that doesn't accurately capture the signature, it's problematic for everybody, but particularly for people who may not have gotten a state ID in a while or don't need a driver's license because they don't drive. Um, so there's a lot of reasons um, why um, it's additionally problematic for, for voters with disabilities to have the signature match. And one way to solve that is to Create, you know, not every state that where you sign your ballot envelope uses a signature match. Um, there are states that um, have other methods of verifying uh, that the ballot um, is being submitted by that voter. Um, that can include um, their including their last four digits of their social security number um, or other other number um, to verify their ballot. So. Um, shouldn't feel you know like signature matching is is inevitable in terms of, of verification um you know uh, we're talking about drop boxes um having more uh flexibility on the part of supervisors of election to put drop boxes um as they're now known in under florida law secure ballot intake stations um in places where um where the supervisors know they can help their voters. Um, uh, the supervisors generally were opposed to these changes because the supervisors, um, I think, really want to serve their voters and make it, um, you know, make it easier to vote. And um, having um, having drop boxes in numerous locations um, and at numerous times of day when people um, can get to them, uh, despite their uh, varying schedules and obligations, um, that removes a barrier. Um, and uh, so I'll start with those uh, those two things. I, I, um, I could probably go on, but I want to make sure that I'm giving space to all my colleagues here. Uh, this is Michelle Bishop, but first of all, that was fantastic. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, the, the only things I wanted to add to that in terms of like starting from state law, because Michelle's right, that's where the action is right now. We're not seeing a lot of movement uh, at the federal level on voting rights law, but in the states we very much are. Um, like now you've got me thinking about drop boxes since you were just talking about it. So I have to throw out there, please, please make sure your drop boxes are designed accessibly and placed on accessible paths of travel. I think drop boxes are great and they really increase options for voters, but we did see some that were not placed accessibly. And that just creates an additional barrier unnecessarily for people with disabilities. And there are people with disabilities in this room that wanna help you with that. Uh, but I think some of the things that we're seeing from a national perspective happening in the States are these attempts to further restrict federally protected rights. And that is, that is an issue. Um, Michelle talked about the right to voter assistance. Uh, from anyone you desire other than your employer or your union rep that is federally protected. Any attempt to restrict who that person can be uh, is a violation of federal law. Any attempt to say 
uh, you could only assist so many people is a viol violation of federal law because if uh, you can only help three people and a fourth person wants your assistance and you have to turn them down, they're effectively being denied the right to the assistant of their choice. Those are violations of federal law. Those, those have been litigated in other states and those states have lost <laughs> because it, it is a violation of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, the other issue that I was so fascinated by our conversation earlier today about um, accessible vote by mail Electronic ballot delivery and electronic ballot marking make vote by mail significantly more accessible, but without electronic return, it's inaccessible and it's a violation of federal law. And that's also been litigated in other states uh, and those states have been required to provide electronic ballot return. Um, you cannot violate the ADA, you, can't, you cannot violate HAVA, and you cannot violate the Voting Rights Act uh, in passage of state laws and creation of state policies. So we had a lot of really great back and forth about, especially when it came to electronic ballot return, the accessibility versus the security and the need to balance those, and there's a lot of truth to that. But something that has to come out of that conversation is making it accessible is a matter of federal law, full stop. And if it's not made fully accessible, that there, there is a legal violation there that needs to be dealt with. We can't say we can't make it accessible until we figure out a way to make it feel more secure for other people. It has to be made fully accessible for people with disabilities right now. I think uh, also just speaking of Florida law, we've seen over the past two years, which is putting up completely unnecessary administrative hurdles um, and procedural hurdles on all voters, but hurdles that disproportionately impact voters with disabilities. And when we just put up unnecessary hurdles, which are not improving the security of our elections, which are not asked for by our, by our own elections officials, then we're just, we're fundamentally making it the more hoops you have to jump through, the more forms you have to fill out. Now in Florida, you have to submit a new vote by mail, vote by mail ballot request after every midterm presidential election, rather than having a request that could be standing so that if you know you need it you have it all the time um you know making people have to submit id just to request a mail ballot if you don't have an id suddenly you don't have any access to vote by mail if you don't have those right id numbers um or as brad said if they don't have numbers on file and, and they can't verify them so i think that there are just just these needs to have you know to not have unnecessary hurdles in place to support all voters and voters with disabilities included in that um, another thing was we just coming also from the conversation this morning was um, having the information available in formats that people it should it should not be that hard to find information on accessible vote by mail. It should be right there with all the other vote by mail information. So not only should those websites be accessible for people to navigate, but they should the information should be very easy to find people when they do have to jump through all these unnecessary hurdles that we've put in their way, at least can find the pathways to help them jump jump through that. Unfortunately, there's a lot of things left. Um, you know, um, I think, you know, one, one thing to remember is we are, at least at the state level, we're very much in defensive posture most of the, the time. I, I don't think we should ever be lulled into a sense of like completely just working on the defense level, not proactively pushing for things. But, um, you know, we are looking at another bill this coming session that will create another ID requirement on returning your vote by mail ballot. Um, they made it very clear they want to do that. They pulled it last um, session and required a study. So it will be back. And there's multiple issues there, both with you know just another um, signature requirement, another um, envelope. Basically, they want to... Um, tinker with the envelopes and they aren't sure what they want to do. And that's part of what the study will be is like, you know, they wanted the state to present options for them, but that's going to be back and going to be a fight. Um, there have been a lot of issues relating to signatures. Uh, supervisors of elections typically have multiple signatures on file, whether you've signed a petition, whether, you know, you did, you signed the tablet at the DHSMV office, and they can compare those. And there have been efforts to restrict their ability to, you know, either just use the most recent one or to only use a wet signature. And thing they've shown a, a desire to come back with something like that too. So those are things that are kind of, you know, I, I guess I'm I'm answering the opposite question. So I'll go back the other way now. But I think you know, curbside voting is something. It was so so. So back, I think the state level. Going to be working mostly in a defensive posture, trying to squeak in a good thing here or there. Uh, at the local level, I think that's where we really have more opportunity working with supervisory elections and local election officials um, who have a lot of latitude um, to implement the law. 
So curbside voting is one of those um, things we see them do. And, you know, of course, there would need to be funding for enough poll workers. One of the pushbacks we've had from, you know, in asking them if they would do that is um, that it takes staff away from other things. So it seems like it's really just a resource question, but funding and also in poll worker recruitment. And that's something a lot of groups have been working on lately as well, recruiting poll workers. And that's something voters uh, with certain disabilities probably can do and, and take part in. That's probably a good thing to do. Um, more drop boxes. They already have quite a bit of latitude as far as where they can put them. They just need to use it. I mean, they have to put them at every early voting site, but they can put them any place could be an early voting site. The obstacles are funding and um, basically uh, the fear of you know getting fined um, and a couple other things. But for the most part, they, they can place more drop boxes around, create more accessibility that way. Um, I think we, you know, one thing that the, uh, with Disability Rights Florida is advocated for consistently is making the websites readable by scanners that some voters with uh, you know revision impaired need to use. Uh, that's something that county supervisors could do, and we could advocate at the local level for. Um, you know, there, we we've been focusing a lot of the last couple of years bad things that have come from these bills, but there were a lot of problems for voters with disabilities before that, whether it be wheelchair accessibility, bathroom accessibility, uh, signage having big enough fonts and little things like that. Those are all things we can advocate for at the local level. Um, you know, one, one other issue that, um, you know, this is sensitive because there are a lot of folks who are religious, but churches uh, are often used for early voting sites, but they don't have to comply with federal accessibility requirements. So that might be a federal change that needs to happen. I'll shut up now. No, thank you so much. Is there anyone else online who wants Add in any suggestions for changes in state or federal law? If I could uh, make just a, a general point here, I think these the comments and points people have made are really good and interesting. I'll, I'll make more of a, a quick general point, um, which is that Lisa and I have done some you know study of that increased turnout in 2020 and uh, among people with disabilities, and it is definitely related to the uh, increased access. Uh, to uh, different voting options uh, as a result of the pandemic. Um, the, the, a lot of states, of course, expanded use of drop boxes. Uh, some states, like my own, mailed ballots to everyone and so forth. And we tracked out these things and found that the states that did expand options for voting in 2020 had especially big increases in voting among people with disabilities. The conclusion that we draw from that is that there's no one size fits all for voting for people with disabilities. The more options, the better. Uh, the, the more options there are, the more likely it is that any one person with a disability will find a good method that works for him or herself. Uh, just, just a real basic point there. So uh, yeah, so, so that, that's it. One, one, one size doesn't fit all. Uh, the more options, the better for people, uh, for voting by people with disabilities. The one thing I would add, and I, I totally agree with what my fellow panelists have said, um, particularly Doug, with the not one size fits all, but I would suggest and 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 continue to say, um, don't be quiet. If there's an issue that occurs with you, do not be quiet about it. Make sure you let someone know. If you are having a difficult time casting your ballot in a polling place, talk to the poll worker, talk to the supervisor that's there so that um, you can actually be able to cast your ballot. And once that's done, make sure that you talk to your policymakers to ensure that this does not happen uh, to others, because if it's happening to you, it's more likely to be happening to others as well. And so the more people that advocate for the change, the more likely that change is gonna happen. Thank you for that. Um, and in that vein, my next question was going to be, you know, how do we spread the word about this? We have, we've talked about a lot of issues and a lot of ideas. Um, how do we get these concepts and the issues and, and um, suggestions for improvement out beyond, you know, the people in this room and the people behind? This is Michelle Bishop, just off the top of my head, because I'm reading the chat at the same time. And someone in the chat said, that um, elections offices should hire people with disabilities. Yeah, they should. I love that idea, right? Uh, we can, two birds with one stone, guys, making voting more accessible and helping to solve the employment gap between disabled and non-disabled people. 
but and I think that's a great idea. I think the other piece of that is that I think elections offices should have staff who are specifically conducting outreach uh, to the disability community and to other marginalized communities when it comes to voting, because we know hiring one person with a disability isn't going to solve the problem. That person has one disability. They know their disability. And to be honest, they know their access needs because not two people who have the same disability don't even have the same experience necessarily. Uh, so one person with a disability having a voice doesn't necessarily solve all problems, but having someone on staff who's doing sophisticated outreach to those communities to make sure that we are hearing the voices of a number of voters with disabilities talking about the barriers they're experiencing and potential solutions for those would go a long way. I think, um, you know, if we want to make voting work for voters, we start by talking to voters and talking to them about what's working and what's not, and really integrating that into the process. What I liked about the idea of bringing staff on board is that we're, um, we're baking it in from the start, right? We have to fully integrate accessibility into how we administer our elections. If we want it to be successful, a lot of times we design a system and we find out after the fact that it's not accessible. And then we have to go back and try to retrofit it and make it work for people with disabilities, which means it's never going to be as accessible as it could have been because those retrofitted solutions aren't going to be as good. It also means it's going to cost a lot more time and a lot more money than it would have to, to really just include people with disabilities up front and design a system that works for everyone from the jump. So that's my answer to that kind of is always go and talk to people with disabilities and and hear what the barriers they're facing are and and try to integrate their solutions no one knows more about running elections than our elections officials but nobody knows more about having a disability than people with disabilities and we can take those two areas of expertise and we can bring them together thank you um unless anyone else has something to add on that point we do have some really good questions from the audience I, the only thing I would add is that um, I agree 100%, and I know this is on tape, so Michelle is going to use this against me at some point, about I actually agree with Michelle with Michelle just said, uh, but also the fact that the EAC has um, now hired someone whose sole job is to work um, with improving accessibility, um, and he's attending this conference today as well. Um, and I think that that's a huge step forward for our agency. You know, we've only been around for less than two decades, but to have someone on staff whose sole job is to work towards accessibility in our clearinghouse function is, is, is a huge step forward. Um, and I also would be remiss if I didn't point out that today is National Voter Registration Day. And I don't know if that was said in the earlier panel, but uh, to ensure that you are registered to vote, but also to check to make sure that your registration is up to date. So um, since it's a national day um, to make sure that you have that done. I do need a recording of this event so that I can play at will a recording of Tom Hicks telling people that I'm right. Yes, that is true. <laughs> I just wanna add one thing. I mean, I think um, when thinking about how the word out or how we can educate voters, we often, you know, we're saying, how do we do it? And we often put the onus on ourselves as advocates or community leaders. Um, I think it's important to remember that election officials are the trusted sources of information, increasingly so as misinformation, disinformation become a problem. So I'm um, putting not only, uh, you know, uh, encouraging people to pay attention to them, but really making sure they play that role. I think as advocates, coming on us to make sure they're doing their part in educating voters. I think the accessible online voting is a good example of that. When we've spoken to, I'm not going to mention names, but when we've spoken to county election officials, they aren't really planning to do what they need to do. I'll just be frank. Um, some, some of them clearly are. I think Leon's a good example of a county that really um, took it as you know an opportunity to work with community groups like Disability Rights Florida and Lighthouse. Um, there was a press splash. There were it was on the radio. We don't see as much of that in other counties, and we should. Um, there, there should be a lot more education coming from our elected officials. We can push, push on them to do that. Uh, I think the other thing I'm seeing more and more of these days is the um, working to uh, connections or intersectionalities between uh, issues that uh, affect people with disabilities and other um, marginalized groups, I'll say. And I think that's that's a really important trend that's going to be very effective in the long haul. 
Um, I think the other thing is, you know, th I think it was Michelle who was saying no uh, better, or no, no person with a disability has the same disability. I think stories are really important, you know, and that, that's everybody needs right now is hearing those personal stories to really relate to predicament, you know, the predicaments of a variety of different challenges voters are facing. And only with that, I think, will uh, supervisors of elections in Florida or other officials really be sensitized to the um, you know, as I was pointing out earlier how that local advocacy opportunity exists, the barriers to change at that level are off. It isn't usually like some sort of principled opposition to something. Sometimes it's just they don't understand why something's a hurdle or they haven't heard from someone yet. Speaking up and um, telling your story is very important. Thank you. Um, so I have, I don't know that we'll be able to get to every single question, but um couple of related questions that I'd like to ask first from the audience. Um, so one person has asked what cases are ongoing now or plan to happen in disability rights, like any litigation. And the second related question is, why aren't we seeing more of these types of legal actions um, in Florida challenging the Constitution of laws that are restricting or criminalizing um, voting? I, this is Michelle Bishop. I don't know if anyone's going to speak to planned litigation <laughs> by any means today. Um, I would say actually there was just a case in Wisconsin recently that just was decided related to voter assistance, uh, where there was an attempt to restrict who can assist a person with a disability to return their vote by mail ballot. Uh, and it was determined that that's a violation of the Voting Rights Act. So that one's really important right now. Um, but I did see Michelle Cantor Cohen about to unmute, so I'll let her take it away too. I bet she has thoughts. Yeah, just um, adding on to um, what Michelle Bishop was saying about uh, the 208 litigation. I think there is a growing, um, dare I say it, a growing consensus in the courts that have addressed the issue that um, that limiting assistance and limiting the assister um, is a violation of 208. There's also a recent North Carolina case that came to a similar decision on a narrower law um, related to restrictions on nursing home and hospital staff helping voters. Um, and um, so it's not the only place uh, that, you know, th this issue is, is starting to boil up in a number of places. Um, uh, as to litigation, there is, um, there is of course pending litigation related to restrictions on vote by mail that's in the appeals court in the 11th circuit. That hearing just happened on Thursday. Um, and these, the claims that, that um, made it up to that point are, are not specific to voters with disabilities. Those claims were unfortunately dismissed earlier in the litigation. Um, but um, I guess I would say that part of the part of being able to bring some of the legal claims too comes down to those stories coming up and um, hearing, you know, having the concrete information and experiences of voters with disabilities who are being harmed um, and, um, you know, speaking out. So that is, um, it's really important for uh, the litigators to be able to, um, uh, to speak and, and to speak those stories and to, to help um, connect those stories with the legal causes of action. Thank you. Thank you both, Michelle's, for that. Um, and before we have to wrap, I did want to give an opportunity for any questions we have in the chat. Tony De Palma, I believe, is our chat moderator again right now. Tony, are there questions in the chat that we can address quickly? Thanks, Caitlin. Um, and yes, the chat is lit. Uh, so just as a general uh, question, a general matter, Carson asked, uh, since we're sharing such good resources and research, if we can uh, share that information after the summit, I think that's a big yes. Um, I wanted to ask a question that C had. So C asked, how does the right to vote privately work in reality? Uh, the accessible voting machine at our polling place was facing the door. So that means everyone walking into the room can see the screen, which means they can see your, who you vote for. The poll workers said they only had to provide the machine and it is up to voters to block the screen. So I was wondering if any of our panelists could speak to whether that uh, meets the requirement for private and independent voting under HAVA. 
Yeah, that does not, this is Michelle Bishop, that does not meet the requirement for private and independent voting, um, which is in HAVA. And I would say the Department of Justice would actually argue that the ADA would provide for that as well. Uh, so that is a federally protected right. And when it is a federally protected right, the elections officials have an obligation to provide it, not the voter themselves. And it's easy to fix, right? You create a new layout for a polling place where the screens are facing a wall. So long as you have enough of a, a distance between the wall and the screen for someone who's using a wheelchair to be able to maneuver behind it, which there's ADA measurements that, that deal with that, uh, then you solve a lot of that problem. There is a complaints process through the state when there are HAVA violations, which is can be a great place to start. Any voter can file those. Um, you could also just talk to your local elections office. If you heard this from a poll worker on election day, uh, who is, you know, essentially a volunteer and incredibly important, but a volunteer, uh, they may not be as versed in what these laws look like. So you can talk to your local elections office and see if that's an issue that can get solved. But if not, you do have that complaints process. Or of course, I'm from NDRN, so I have to say, you can also contact Disability Rights Florida to help you advocate around that issue as well. Thank you Thanks so much. Oops, sorry, go ahead. If, um... This is Michelle Kandrakone. If I might also add that issues with poll workers can also sometimes be addressed through election protection and 866 our vote. Um, because one, you know, one thing that's part of the election protection process is flagging things that are systemic, including systemic within a precinct. If you have a problem poll worker that's giving people bad information, whether it's about ID or their rights under HAVA to that private ballot on the machine or anything really. Um, the hotline volunteers are definitely trained when there's a problem with a poll worker that needs to, to go up to the election official in charge of the precinct. And if not that, then, you know, go up where it takes to the, um, you know, in, in Florida's case, the, the supervisor, um, because ultimately the poll worker is the supervisor's responsibility. And one last note on that, poll workers are really important. And we have so many new poll workers right now who don't necessarily know all the rules. And it is so important for all of us to be promoting individuals who are pro-democracy and want to help voters to be poll workers right now so that we have, so that those problems are solved up front, that we have conscientious folks who want to help voters signing up to poll workers throughout our elections. If I can share a resource on that, um, workelections.org is a fair election center resource. Um, that's a central location for um, uh, applying to be a poll worker um, and, and connects um, users of the website with um, the, ju ju ah, the jurisdiction um, where they, you know, where they might um, be eligible to be a poll worker. All right, I wanna thank everybody. Thank you to our panelists and also thank you, Caitlin, for moderating our, our today. Um, we are going to go ahead and break for about 10 minutes. So we're going to come back at 1120. Uh, during the break, we're going to play one of our one of two videos that Disability Rights Florida produced in partnership with Access to Vote. Florida. The videos demonstrate how to use accessible voting machines that are available to Florida voters. Uh, in the videos, self-advocates talk to us about their voting experiences the importance of the disability vote and the rights of voters with disabilities. They, uh, the videos feature English and Spanish captions as well as American Sign Language interpreters. Uh, the video, videos can be found on Access the Vote Florida website, accessthevote.org, and also on YouTube. The video project was funded by the American Association of People with Disabilities and the Protection and Advocacy for Voting Access program. We also wish to, to give special thanks to the Supervisor of Elections offices in Leon and Duke counties. The videos were filmed in their offices and their employees narrated the content. Um, I'd also like to remind everybody who is here in person that if you would like to register to vote during the break or after the summit that you can uh, do so in the lobby both and uh, Olivia can do that. So again, we're going to reconvene at 1120. Thank you.
Supervisor of Elections Building in Leon County, Florida, then Andrea Jenkins, self-advocate. I'm Andrea Jenkins. I live and work in Tallahassee, Florida. I am wearing a blue dress with a cardigan, black cardigan, and I have hazel eyes and blonde hair. Hi, my name is Alex Mosco. I'm a public information specialist with the Leon County Supervisor of Elections. I'm a white man, I'm 39 years old, and I have gray hair. Each eligible American citizen has the right to vote in an election. And one in four adults in the United States has some type of disability, making it important to ensure that all voting sites have accessible voting machines for all to be able to exercise that right. People turn in paper ballots at a voting center. Andrea. People without disabilities may take the privilege of voting for granted. However, the regular ballot isn't accessible to individuals with disabilities. Ensuring accessible elections is a part of what we do. That's why we've made it a part of our mission statement. And the Help America Vote Act requires at least one voting machine in every polling place be accessible to anyone with a disability. A poll worker sets up an accessible voting machine. To use the voting technology, we make sure to train our poll workers so that they know how to use the machines, where to locate them to protect voter privacy, and inform voters that they are available. A poll worker guides Andrea to a voting machine and shows her how to use the machine as Alex explains. When you arrive to vote, inform a poll worker that you need to use an accessible voting machine and they should direct you to an available option. Remember, voting accessibility is your right. In this video, we'll go over the features of the ImageCast voting machines, which is what we use here in Leon County so that you can be prepared to vote. An image cast voting machine featuring a screen and panel of buttons. The image cast machine was designed for accessibility, which means that voters with disabilities can cast their ballots using the standard equipment we have available at every voting site in our county. Andrea. Have no fear. It's a very simple process. They will help you to get set up and get oriented to the machine and how it works. A poll worker inserts a paper ballot into the machine. We will cover an overview of the device. The ImageCast machine provides voters with several accessibility features, including a large screen to better view and cast the ballot, assistive input devices for accessible ballot navigation and voting, including a keypad, headphones, sip and puff, and paddles. Audio instructions from the machine. Please select your assistive input device. You have chosen to use the audio tactile interface. A user keypad, also known as an audio tactile interface, or ATI, is a handheld controller that is used during voting. It is connected to the ImageCast machine, and a set of headphones can connect directly to the controller. The keypad also includes T-coil coupling, a device that works with hearing aids and cochlear implants to couple with assistive listening devices, audio systems, and cell phones. The ImageCast machine has a T4 rating for interference. If you have your own preferred accessible equipment, including paddles, sip and puff devices, or T-coil couples, you may wish to bring them with you when you go to vote. You can then use your own accessible equipment when interacting with the voting machines. If you are blind or have low vision, the ImageCast machine provides additional accessibility options. First, the visual display can be adjusted using the zoom and contrast buttons. There are three different zoom levels to enlarge the screen for individuals with low vision, and the contrast button allows users to view text and informational graphics at a higher contrast. The machine also has a privacy mask feature, which allows the voter to use the audio functions only and black out the screen for additional privacy. The keypad is accessible for blind voters because of the raised keys and braille text identifying each function. The ImageCast machine can read the ballot aloud through headphones, to vote in this contest, press the blue down arrow. This can benefit voters with blindness and people with low vision, and also people with invisible disabilities like learning or intellectual disabilities. As someone who's visually impaired, I utilize the ATI, which speaks out the selections, and that allows me to make my selections confidentially. Once you're ready, the poll worker should then step away 
allowing you to complete your ballot in privacy, a right that all eligible citizens should be able to access. Prior to learning about the accessible voting machine, I would have friends try to assist me with the voting and it didn't seem very private or discreet, so it's wonderful to be able to have the option of voting on my own. The keypad contains raised buttons that can be identified by touch by their different shapes and visually by their bright colors. The buttons on the controller include a red X-shaped button in the middle for selecting and deselecting candidates and other ballot choices, selecting options in the audio and touch screen settings, and to print the ballot when prompted. Blue up and down arrows to the right of the red X button for navigating through instructions and candidate selections. Yellow left and right arrows to the left of the red X button to navigate through the contest and questions on the ballot, to access audio and touch screen settings, as well as to review selections and cast your ballot. Two small round orange buttons at the top right for changing the audio speed, two small square white buttons at the top left for adjusting the volume, and a long green help button across the bottom of the controller for pausing the voting session, getting instructions, or getting a poll worker's attention. You can always press the green help button in a voting session to get help from any polling worker and they'll come around and assist you. For people with disabilities that impact dexterity, the keypad can accommodate sip and puff or paddle switches. The keypad can also be operated with one hand. There are two types of sip and puff devices, the headset device and the gooseneck device. The poll worker will assemble the unit with disposable gloves for your health and safety. Disposable straws are also used for sanitary purposes. The poll worker will connect the sip and puff to the device for you. The device is activated as long as the sip or puff is maintained. The sip and puff will enable the voter to choose by sipping on the straw and then selecting the preferred option by breathing into the tube slightly. Voters can then sip consecutively to confirm their choice and puff once the next button appears in order to advance the screen. To change a selection, voters can scroll through options by sipping consecutively and then puffing once their choice is selected. A person uses a sip and puff straw to scroll through options on the screen. You have selected butter pecan. For ballots that have a write-in option, the puff feature will activate an on-screen keypad that can be moved through via sipping to locate a desired letter and puffing to select one's choice. You have reached the end of the ballot and the ballot is fully voted. Yay! Says I've reached the end of the ballot. All done. All done. Once the voter goes through the voting process using the keypad, they can review, edit, and verify their selections before casting their ballot. You'll be prompted to go to the ballot review screen. You'll then press the blue down arrow to go through each of your selections. When you've reviewed all of your selections, you'll be prompted to press the red X button to print your ballot. The built-in printer produces a marked paper ballot that serves as the official ballot record. The paper ballot is then tabulated by the voting machine the same as any other paper ballot. A poll worker helps Andrea print and cast her ballot. We're going to put it back in the machine like a regular ballot. Okay. The ballot was successfully cast. Andrea places an I voted sticker on her shirt as she exits the voting center. Voting for me has been super empowering and being able to access the vote in an accessible way is really helpful. Individuals with disabilities, it's extraordinarily important that we make our voice heard within society by casting our votes along with everyone else. We hope that this video helped prepare you for using the ImageCast machine when you go to vote in upcoming elections. Thank you. These materials were produced and funded by Access the Vote Florida and Disability Rights Florida Incorporated in association with Block by Block Creative through the Federal Protection and Advocacy for Voting Access Grant Program administered by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Administration for Community Living, and through additional support by the American Association of People with Disabilities. pandemic. So I just wanted to say that. I come
Okay, everyone, we're going to get started again. Uh, welcome back. Uh, I'm going to ask the uh, panelists for our panel number three to go ahead and come up to the table as I introduce this section of our program. Our next panel will address sectionality at the crossroads of identity. The disability community is one that can be a member of at any time. Therefore, intersectionality plays a significant role in disability issues, including civic engagement. Members of the LGBTQ, BIPOC, and disability community, as well as those engaged in voting and civic access work, come together to discuss the crossroads and importance of honoring multiple identities, considering voter access. The moderator for this panel is Maddie Crawley. Maddie is social media and contact content specialist for Disability Rights Florida and a member of Act Vote Florida. One thing I want to uh, let everyone know before we get started and as our panelists get settled is that um, if you have posed a question during the uh, summit and it hasn't been answered, uh, if you could uh, just go ahead and continue to post in the chat and we're going to pull those questions out and then send you an answer after the summit. Uh, if you are in person, you can send us an email at communicationsgroup at disabilityrightsflorida.org. And if you didn't write that down, just come see me uh, sometime during the summit. All right, so we're going to get started. I'm going to hand it over to Maddie. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Really excited to get this third panel up and going. Um, can I get a thumbs up for the folks who can hear me okay? All right, sounds great. Um, to get started, we're going to introduce each of ourselves. Uh, my name is Maddie Crowley. I use she, they pronouns. And as a visual description, um, I'm a white non-binary person. I have brown, short, curly hair with bangs, and I'm wearing a blue vote, um, Access the Vote Florida shirt. And I also have tattoos up my arm.
Good morning. My name is Sarah Goldman. Um, I am the Director of Administration and Youth Initiatives for the Independent Living Council. I am sitting in a wheelchair. I have short brownish hair and I am wearing a blue and orange shirt. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Jasmine Gajigal. I am the state outreach director and Florida coordinator of Vote Writers. I am a uh, Latina uh, with long dark hair wearing a black and white sweater. I am excited to chat with everyone today uh, about um, voting and intersectionality. Hello, my name is Cecile Schoon. I'm an African-American woman with kind of a crazy fro and I'm 63 years old. I'm wearing a vote shirt for my sorority, Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of the state of Florida. And it's quite an honor to be here. I am taking notes uh, madly and just very, very, um, amazed at what much information there is and how much more work that we need to do. So I'm really, really happy to be here. Thank you. Yes, it's an honor to have each of you here. And for our folks that are online, um, David and Nadine, would you please introduce yourselves? All right, we're going to go ahead and move on to some of okay. our- Hi there. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Hi, my name is Nadine Smith. I am the executive director of Equality Florida. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a black woman, 57 years old, uh, with amazing dreadlocks and um, glasses and my purple Equality Florida t-shirt. Wonderful, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So let's go ahead and get started. And when David is able to join us, he can just pop on and interrupt me and introduce himself and give a visual description as well. Um, so thank you all so much for being here. If you could just kind of re-share a little bit more about what work you do and where um, where you kind of um, have your area of expertise, your experiences and things like that. All right, this is Cecile Schoon. In my day job, I'm Title VII plaintiff's attorney on, on the employment side. So for the last almost 35 years, I've been doing discrimination cases for the seven protected classes. Um, I personally represented a person who was totally deaf. I have represented a person who was totally blind. And that did present uh, some challenges, but we were successful in, in both claims in getting them some relief. So I have some interaction with uh, dealing with some of those issues. Um, but I, with the voting, it's just so powerful uh, that people are really still, you know, struggling and fighting to have the, the same you know level of, of control and privacy uh, that 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 other citizens have and I'm I'm really struck by that in my prior practice with those two individuals my office did provide those additional accommodations and because you, know, you a lawyer always talks to their client no matter who they are or what their abilities or disabilities are I didn't really notice you know, that they were missing anything. You know, it took us a little more time to communicate, but it's really different and it's really opened my eyes more to see it, how private it is when you vote. <laughs> That's a totally different story than talking to your lawyer. That's private between the two of you, but it's just a very different perspective. Um, some of the things that the league has done uh, to 
to address this and it's something we're growing in and I've got a <laughs> notes of things I want us to look at going forward. But our website, which was updated a, a year or two ago, is ADA compliant. And I think that was a relatively new um, development. Um, we started our Zooms identifying ourselves, what we look like, like we did this morning just now. And uh, we have closed captioning that we're on. So we're, you know, we're, we're learning to do more. And Marilyn, that was on the other panel, is to guide us. Um, going forward, I think uh, I would like to see a specific uh, link on our website that talks about disability rights and refers to the different uh, um, sources that many of which were mentioned today. And I, going forward, I believe I'm going to be asking our 29 leagues to inquire, because we say sometimes you just want to know what's going on, touch temperature around the, the state, because we have 29 leagues. What is going on with regards to, and we'll give them some standard questions. We'll talk to you guys about, and Olivia and Marilyn, hey, there are the little survey questions we want to know so that we can be more alerted to where we can give some education and guidance. Thank you. This is Sarah. Um, so I have cerebral palsy, so I obviously am a self-advocate. I also, for my full-time job, work at the Florida Independent Living Council. And so I just want to give a little bit of background. Um, I saw some folks on Zoom are from the Centers for Independent Living. So shout out to all you that are on Zoom this morning. Um, we have 15 centers from around the state of Florida. So all 67 counties are presented. Um, and I think there might be a PowerPoint that's going to be popped up. Um, if not, I can certainly send you all a map of in-person people. There's brochures out there where you can find your local centers for independent living. But the Florida Independent Living Network promotes independence, full access, and informed choice for people with disabilities. And so all of our centers are consumer controlled. Uh, they are community-based, so they're not residential facilities, and they are non-for-profits. Non and I always say they are uh, for people with disabilities, by people with disabilities. They provide five core services, which are information and referral, um, individual and system advocacy, peer support, independent living skills and training, and transition services. And based on your center for independent living, um, there also may be some other programs provided, such as youth transition, which is where we come in and we'll be talking today, um, support groups, home modifications, and durable medical equipment loans. So the Florida Independent Living Council specifically oversees the state plan for independent living. We have four goals um, that are in our state plan for the next three years. Then I'll highlight two of them real quick. The first is on disaster preparedness and also uh, youth initiatives. So getting our youth with disabilities involved, teaching them the self-advocacy skills, the needed transition skills, to live independently, which is how I'll be representing on the panel this morning. Hi, Jasmine Gallego again. Um, I am with uh, Vote Writers. We are a nationwide 501c3 nonprofit that focuses on voter ID. And for anyone that might not be aware of voter ID, it explains what IDs your state uh, focuses on in terms of what is required of you when you go to vote in person or what might required for you to submit for a vote by mail uh, request application. As Brad mentioned earlier today, we function uh, to ensure that voters are being able to vote with confidence and not um, not being prevented from going to the polls uh, due to either a lack of confidence due to confusion regarding your state's voter ID laws or from not having um, a state ID. And so our mission is um, to essentially make sure that all voters are voting with confidence and we do so by providing one-on-one -on -one assistance with voting questions as well as assistance in being able to obtain supporting documents that you might need to be able to obtain a state ID or driver's license. Our ultimate goal is to outfit everyone that's eligible to vote with a state ID or driver's license to be able to ensure that uh, we are helping to get everyone with what's most widely accepted nationwide. And so we'll cover the cost of 
uh, birth certificates, marriage certificates, um, any transportation to and from the DMV, uh, as well as the driver's license or ID uh, at the DMV and with every step of the way, provide pro bono uh, assistance when necessary uh, for things like name changes. And we are uh, here to talk about, um, I'm here to talk about state ID a bit and kind of jump into why there are so many restrictions um, around state ID and why this might pose a restriction for uh, that have historically been marginalized in the voting process. Um, those that are less likely to turn out to vote due to voter ID are voters of color, uh, students, people with disabilities, um, trans voters, uh, women, and um, I might be missing one there, but there's a lot of groups that have historically been marginalized. And so every time that we're able to center these um, or these groups of people and also organizations that work to uplift these voices and our leadership and our uh, voices, we're able to amplify um, learning more about understanding how we can get closer to making sure that all of our voices are heard. So that essentially, we can have a democracy that functions at the very fullest. Thank you all so much for expanding a bit on your work. Um, we're happy to have David on Zoom with us. Um, David, if you could please introduce yourself, share a little about your work, and also please provide a visual description. Um, take it away. Yes, I apologize about that. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> a little technical difficulties. Um, thank you for inviting us to be on the panel. My name is David Darm. Um, I guess in terms of visual description, I am a uh, a white male with blonde hair, glasses, I'm wearing a tie and a jacket. Um, just in terms of a personal background, uh, before I get into my professional side, I am uh, legally blind, visually impaired. Uh, so all my life, I have been uh, a student with a disability going through the education system and then transitioning into the workforce. I've had to overcome um, a numerous amount of barriers with that and it developed the passion for being an advocate um, and raising awareness of what it's like to live with a disability. Uh, and then eventually having reached my full independence, uh, was able to give back and serve. The last uh, 10 plus years of my career has been in public service for the state of Florida um, in various roles, but mostly focusing on uh, employment barriers and transportation barriers. Uh, so in terms of transitioning into the, the profession and the role I play in representing on this panel, uh, I work for the organization called the Commission for the Transportation Disadvantaged, uh, better known as the TD program. Uh, we serve all over the state of Florida. We oversee the funding, um, statewide funding for transportation services for people with disabilities, uh, low income populations and older adults uh, in each of the counties. And we work with transit agencies and uh, human service organizations, not-for-profits and various groups that serve uh, our population. And we try to get them, uh, we, we sort of serve as a stop gap. We try to look for where uh, people have limited transportation to work or medical appointments and try to get them uh, where they need to go, which includes voter uh, poll access. So we cover quite a variety of different um, activities, but um, obviously for today's purpose it's to for our role is to raise awareness about our services um, so various groups who would qualify could be eligible for those services to access um, the voting rights. Wonderful. Thank you so much for further elaborating on your work, David, and thank you for being here. Um, so we're going to get started. We have some individualized questions for each of our panelists today hopefully get to some questions towards the end that all panelists can be able to answer and feed in on. Yeah. Uh, but we're I, think you, uh, I think you meant to go to me last there. Yeah, I was going to transition and ask you to speak a bit oh, about okay. your and ask your oh, question. So that sounds fine. That sounds fine. Sorry about that. No, you're great. Um, so Nadine, can you please talk a little bit more about your work and then, um, you know, start to talk bit about voter disenfranchisement um, as a concern for those who hold multiple marginalized identities and belong to multiple communities and what that kind of like for LGBTQ folks with disabilities, which is sometimes an often less considered intersectionality, um, an intersection that folks consider. 
All right. Well, first of all, just to make sure everybody knows um, about our organization, Equality Florida, we are the state's LGBTQ education and advocacy organization. Uh, we're one of the largest uh, state-based organizations doing that work in the country. And um, not only do we work specifically around LGBTQ issues, intersectionality is core to our mission. We understand very clearly that anti-Black attacks, attacks on um, um, indigenous and other people of color communities are all tied together. And that includes attacks on, and, and a failure to address the issues that arise um, for people with disabilities. And one of the hats, uh, well, let me just say this, right now we are seeing a wave of legislation and policy changes driven by the governor uh, to push back on progress being made to literally erode safe spaces in schools where school districts are, are telling teachers to scrape safe school stickers off their, off their um, walls, um, where books are being taken off bookshelves in school districts if they uh, reflect the existence of LGBTQ people or speak honestly about race and racism and tell the honest story of our country's history. So in an atmosphere of increased censorship, increased governmental intrusion into medical decisions, um, whether that's abortion or gender affirming care, uh, what we see is a familiar path um, that has arisen in, in US history and world history where the most vulnerable uh, become the targets, become the scapegoats uh, for those who seek power. And we see it now with a, a governor who is really um, focused on a presidential run and is, is doing things in service to increasing his, his name and his brand nationally. And the reason that uh, that creates ought to create a great deal of concern for those of us who care about democracy and access uh, is that he is, he is functioning in a way that is no longer accountable to the people of Florida. It, it is about, you know, why is the governor of Florida tricking uh, people legally seeking asylum in Texas to Florida airfield and then flying them to Martha's Vineyard? Um, so it's a, I, I, I just wanna highlight that for me, this is a very dangerous time for our democracy and a very dangerous time for those of us who are often uh, at the margins of uh, the centers of power. And one of the things that we see in this rhetoric um, is not only a, um, a push for policies that either directly limit who has access to the ballot or have been designed to have a disproportionate impact um, to keep certain demographics from accessing the ballot. Um, it comes at a time of, of sort of increased um, political strategies where the cruelty is the point, that where the, the concern and empathy for our fellow, um, for our neighbors uh, is seen as weakness. You see it in the, in the governor telling uh, masked students at, a, at an event to take their masks off, regardless of whether or not it put them at greater risk or, or loved ones uh, with you know, compromised immune systems at greater risk. So I, I just wanna sort of set the table for this because what we are seeing now is, you know, the cycle returning where these attacks on LGBT students and on um, honest conversations about racism are a lot like the Johns Committee back in the 50s and 60s, um, where you saw purges in the education system. You also saw attacks on voting rights when you saw um, Anita Bryant teaming up with the moral majority, their issues were attacks on the LGBTQ community and their opposition to equal access in education. And we saw then a rise in efforts to limit access to the ballot. And so now we are seeing uh, these similar uh, dynamics playing out. And so one of the other hats that I wear is I'm chair of the Florida Advisory Committee to the US uh, Commission on Civil Rights, and this is the second time we're we are examining the um, voting rights in the state of Florida, especially in light of 
recent legislation that has passed. I'm gonna drop in the comments here uh, or, or in the chat for everyone, the report that came out of our last um, examination of voting rights, including a look at um, the things that are impacting uh, the disability community. We were grateful to have Tony De Palma and, and uh, Olivia Babas provide testimony that informed that report, but the process is now open to comment once again. And I think it's really critical that uh, that comment can come not just from organizations, but also from individuals who want to talk about ways in which access to the ballot uh, is being impacted. And, and, and while the focus is on new legislation, you know, there's nothing that is out of bounds. Like we, we are seeing, you know, clearly uh, efforts to prevent the trans community from getting um, IDs updated that reflect their, um, their new names and gender are, are an impediment when you can't get that information to match up with the voter rolls. But the, the issue is bigger than individual, these individual spaces. It's, you know, an over-reliance on, on uh, f you know, churches that are free to put up um, language on, the, on their marquees, even as they serve as a voting site, you know, during the marriage fight, we were voting in places where the marquee at the church was advocating against marriage equality. There, there are lots of places where the um, uh, where our access to the ballot on an individual basis at this precinct or that precinct can be curtailed. But I think it's important for us to understand that there's an overall messaging right now. Uh, in fact, you will see it in places where uh, the same folks advocating for more restrictive uh, voting, for um, less uh, early voting, for fewer, uh, the, the, you know, uh, curtailing the ability to drop off ballots early, are also uh, insisting on the use of republic as opposed to democracy. We are a republic, but their rhetoric is intended to say, this is not a, a direct democracy. One, one person, one vote is not that important. There's, a, there's an entire ideology around it that should be very troubling to people about um, you know, a belief that restricting and intimidating voters um, and keeping the, the well, I'll, I will say it this way and I'll just say it plainly. What we are seeing is the panic driven by the diversity of America, the, the, the browning of America, the, the fear of losing power by a, um, as a demographer, um, Jeffrey Johnson said, we are in a, a demographic collision where we are increasingly a country of old white people and young brown people. And, and while the, that latter generation is growing rapidly, that older generation still holds the reins of power. And so the, the disconnect uh, between where the majority of Americans are and where those who hold levers of power are is creating this sort of, you know, it's, it's why, you know, the person who, who gets the most votes in a, in a presidential election um, has not been, you know, consistently the uh, elect president. There's, there's a real battle right now uh, for the, the future of our country. And we are seeing a step-by-step, state-by-state effort to dismantle these safeguards. And, and we have to understand that, that it doesn't matter if the language they wrap it in is um, around race, the impact of it is going to impact every community that has seen its, the protections for that community grow because of the power we've been able to flex at the ballot box. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Nadine, for really laying the foundation in this conversation that we're we're talking about and you know, calling attention to all intersectionality and all identities and how they will be impacted in these various, you know, culture wars and and um, voting restrictions and things of that nature. So thank you. Thank you for that. And I think I'd like to, you know, transition over to Jaslyn, if you could talk a little bit about um, your work at Vote Writers, when it comes to current state ID laws, how, what does that look like in Florida versus other parts of the country? And how does that 
kind of negatively impact marginalized folks, especially folks with disabilities? Oh, wow. We have a lot to unpack here. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I actually realized that I didn't address uh, my personal connection to disability in the first question. So I apologize. Uh, so I had Gilliam Barre syndrome as a child which uh, left me unable to access um, all my limbs. Um, I no longer identify as a person with disabilities, um, but have that personal connection and am thus an ally. Um, by the time I was in college, I had two parents with disabilities and was a caretaker. And so I'm a um, huge advocate for a lot of caretaking issues. And um, I am on the uh, Disability Policy Initiative at Georgetown University to continue doing um, lobbying for disability rights and those of caretakers and patients. Um, at Vote Writers specifically for people with disabilities, we've been told several times before that an ID has um, saved someone's life to be able to access life-saving care um, or either being able to access um, a doctor or to be able to pick up their prescriptions. Um, and so that's been the case on more than one occasion. Unfortunately, um, so that's something that we really want to bring light to is the overlap of being able to access social services in addition to not just vote, but you can access things that you need on day to day life. So those are include housing, medical care, uh, job access. Um, you can't new hire paperwork without an ID. And so these are all things that we need um, to be able to go about our day to day life. And more so if you can't. Um, go out and vote, you're not communicating that story at the ballot box. And it's so it's the one that we really want to be able to lift up is that intersectionality of needing the or that um that crossover of needing that ID for your social services and for um issues that you are facing in your day-to-day -day, day life. And then also communicating that at the polls that these gaps are existing in these communities. Um, so with voter ID, as I mentioned before, they, um, oh, voter ID laws negatively impact communities that have been historically marginalized. So this includes women because we are more likely to get our names changed after we get married. And so we need that extra document to go ahead and get our ID. Um, on average, I usually start off our voter ID trainings with the question of how much do you think an ID costs? Um, and answers will go from like $30 to $60 on average. But really, it's a trick question because uh, the supporting documents that you need um, each can be about $50 on average. And so there was one woman that I was in Pennsylvania who um, really needed her ID to be able to go to the doctor and she had to get two marriage certificates from Pennsylvania. And so overall, her process ended up costing upwards of almost $300. Um, and so it's an incredibly costly process. And as someone who... Um, came from a family of parents with disabilities. I know the huge financial toll that uh, disabilities can take on you and how much that um, the alleviation of those documents can really make a huge difference. And so the writers is always here to help eligible voters be able to cover the cost of those documents. Um, we know that, that whether it's $30 or several hundred dollars, it makes an incredible difference. Additional communities include uh, people of color that often fall in the intersection of um, low income communities and also include trans communities, as Nadine mentioned, uh, trans uh, ID, being able to help with the process of being able to change your name is incredibly time consuming and expensive and it depends on really where you live. Um, and so we are able to help with that as well. Um, in addition to that, students. Um, Student ID is one that is legal in the state of Florida. However, the language that's used is current and valid. So student IDs don't have an expiration date on them. And so what ends up happening is it's kind of at the discretion of the person at polls and poll workers are human. And uh, voter ID is really intensive with information at times. And so it's very natural for us to not driver's license or state ID and kind of be like, hesitant, unfortunately, to that. Um, so this year, I intentionally voted with my college ID and my library card, and I did receive some hesitation at the polls. Um, so I just wanted to test it out. So it's real. Um, but I will go ahead and read off the list of what is allowed um, at the polls. Bring a driver's license, a state ID, a U.S. passport, a debit or credit card, military ID, student ID, retirement center ID, neighborhood association ID, public assistance ID, Veterans Health ID card, a license to carry, 
uh, an employee ID card issued by the federal government, state of Florida, county, municipality, or other entity in Florida. And um, you need to make sure that you have a photo signature, but they do not have to be on the same card. So for example, I use my student ID card to vote this year, and I use my library card, which had my signature on it. Um, but the caveat to that is that I needed uh, a driver's license to get, get my um, ID card to begin with. And so um, a lot of these are kind of things that you can't get without that ID. So a passport um, are, is a really uncommon one if you don't already have an ID. And these are all things that we assist um, with individuals being able to obtain. And then um, one that I did not go over is individual uh, disabilities are um, more less likely to turn out to vote due to voter ID restrictions. Um, in part due to the fact that um, signature matching. So our muscular abilities change and then our signatures don't match. So then we are always advocating being able to make sure that um, you have an up-to-date um, ID that matches your signature on your voter registration and being able to make sure that both are up-to-date. Um, and then also just reaching out to us if you need assistance. Um, our phone number is 844-338-8743. Once again, that's 844-338-8743. Or three, and you can reach us at votewriters.org if you need one-on-one -on -one assistance. Thank you so much for that really comprehensive review of your org, all of the work that you do to help folks. Um, and thank you also for speaking to really those institutional barriers that are set up against folks, specifically talking up, you know, those financial barriers that exist, especially for marginalized folks, that additional financial burden that folks have to carry. So another you kind of mentioned is our ability to actually get to the polls. And thankfully, we, we have David here. So David, could you speak a little bit about education as a challenge for folks in the disability community and how that's amplified by intersectionality? And how can we better address this issue to ensure um, accessible transport for the disability community as a whole, but also to the polls? Yes, thank you. Um... Well, just to kind of give a background on um, what I guess what have what efforts have been made uh, to promote accessible transportation. Uh, obviously, the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is a far reaching law um, addressing public access um, for people with disabilities in various various uh, public places. Uh, but in terms of transportation, it really was far reaching in terms of um, those who had the, the general public who have access to public transit uh, or fixed bus routes, that uh, there were additional measures put in place by the ADA to ensure that those individuals had physical access to a bus, a bus stop um, or bus vehicle. But also, um, as we know, many, uh, many metropolitan areas that those bus services are very challenging to navigate. Uh, for someone with a physical or uh, developmental disability. Uh, so in addition to that, the ADA took it a step further, requiring that public transportation agencies have to do what's called paratransit, scheduled door-to-door -door services for those that live within a, a fixed route. Uh, so these are um, available opportunities for people who live in within a metropolitan community they can access those services. Um, the challenge gets into play when, uh, for those that do not live within a community with a fixed route, for example, um, I'll use a personal example. I am originally from uh, a suburban area of Jacksonville uh, called Orange Park. It's in Clay County. Uh, but at, when I was going growing up, there was no major fixed route or public transit option. Um, you, you would have to go all the way to the interstate uh, to access uh, Jacksonville Transportation Authority uh, through their service um, over in Duval County, which did have that ADA paratransit. So, uh, so one barrier I would say that has been noted is those individuals who don't live within a fixed route or within a metropolitan community uh, has have more limited access. Now, where the state of Florida has been um, making strides into addressing this challenge is through our program at the uh, commission. We uh, fund all the counties. We provide funding for every single one to do those paratransit 
type services that the ADA does not afford uh, to ensure that those individuals could get access to it. Uh, we also broaden, you talked about intersectionality, uh, for our point of view, it's not just somebody who has the physical disability who cannot access a fixed bus route. We actually broaden it and look at income. Uh, so low income is also an eligibility um, that we, we provide services for when their financial barrier prevents them from accessing a, a vehicle or a private transportation option. And we also um, look at seniors and older adults who, uh, because of their age, presents a barrier to transportation. Uh, another area of interest, I would say, probably for this group that would be important would be, you know, we have these we have these paratransit services, but of course, um, it it doesn't really it's not as effective if we don't have representation of the people impacted by these services. Uh, being able to weigh in on the design of them. So on the other side of the transit world, beyond just the physical service, is the planning process. So your metropolitan planning organizations and regional planning councils are really critical to be engaged with because, you know, you could have um, the state-of-the-art bus service, but if you're not considering um, where the bus stop is located in an intersection where it might be dangerous to cross, uh, those are some situations where we see, you know, importance of inclusion and engagement from uh, rider advocates and groups that are impacted by this. So from our side, we have what's called local uh, coordinating boards or local TD boards that are trying to engage that uh, representation and having, uh, you know, voices from the different groups impacted by these services. And those are the ones that I would suggest um, that you, you get engaged with uh, because you know we're we're we make our services based on what information we have and uh, so getting active uh, participation in, in those uh, development of those service plans and um, ensuring that that we have uh, not just um, representation from say someone like me who's visually impaired but you know across the various groups impacted and needing of transportation services. Yes, thank you so much, David, and thank you for really speaking to a variety of intersectionality and identities and, you know, being honest and transparent about your positionality in this space, because um, it's really important to acknowledge how these things impact us all um, from where you live and for folks that are in rural areas with maybe low income who have disabilities, that access is different. Um, and you touched briefly on gender, and I'd like to pivot over um, back to Cecile and ask you a bit about what work the League of Women Voters is doing in Florida to promote the inclusion and prosperity of women and femmes with disabilities in your voting work. Well, the League is, we are totally committed to enlarging uh, the community of civic engagement and reaching out to any group, all groups that have in particular been marginalized for historical reasons, sometimes by the state itself. And um, and that really goes back to our chart, which a lot of people don't know, and I'll just mention it quickly. The first suffragettes, who were the, the women who were trying to fight for the right to vote, actually were abolitionists. They were quite, and they were so upset and offended that a man would try to uh, play God, basically. Many of them were Quakers. They were, it was like blasphemy, and they wanted to talk about this in the street. And the, many of their husbands said, No, go back to the kitchen. So they literally learned the value of the vote because they were very interested in stopping what they thought was blasphemy. And then they realized we have very little power. We have to get our own vote so we can advocate for others. And the league has never forgotten that. And so even though, uh, many members uh, don't have the traditional disabilities. We, many of our members are, are older. And as I've uh, been involved in leadership, I've seen many of my members starting to walk with canes or with wheelchairs. So it, it's happening right before my eyes. And I myself, I'm not jumping up and running around the way I used to. So we are very, very aware that as we work to, uh, 
make things uh, more readily available and fair for people with physical disabilities and, and different, different type of abilities, we're really doing it for all of us. Because if we are blessed to live so long, you know, eventually most of us have some deterioration of our normal, what we had as youth, whether it be our ability to walk or our vision or hearing or whatever other, you know, challenges that we have. So the, the, we are absolutely committed to this journey. And um, we, we, I can commit to you that we will continue that. Now, with regards to women's issues, the league is the League of Women Voters. So we we fundamentally understand um, and have been more assertive with regards to women's right to choose. Because from our perspective, for example, our experience tells us that if you have uh, pregnancies that you did not intend, that absolutely impacts your time, your, your ability to be civically engaged, to run for office, and many other things that you would like to do. So we don't see those two things as like separate. We see them as very, very close. So we're partnering with our allies to work on those issues. And we know from our experience in litigation and just our experience doing voter registration at many of the fairs and festivals in the public, that there is an incredible layering of limitations that are economic, gender-based, because women don't have as high-paying jobs. You layer onto that racial um, differences, or if we have an immigrant background, and then if you put in there a disability, one of those layers often makes it more difficult for you to have full access. And we are definitely aware of that and try to, in every way that we can, place ourselves in environments where we can work on that. Thank you. No, thank you. And I appreciate, you know, you mentioning your commitment to the disability community, you being here today and present and active and taking away to share with the whole state of League of Women Voter Coalition. So it's very exciting. And you mentioned too, like age and disability, how that kind of progressive and looks different um, for folks they get older, they might experience disability or illnesses or things like that, that they didn't experience in their youth. However, we have such a powerful youth voter coalition. Um, as in another panel, young voters with disabilities are super engaged and very excited about being civically engaged. So I'm hoping, um, Sarah, can you kind of speak to this importance of civic engagement and how we can really get disabled youth excited to make them feel like their voice matters. And then after that, um, I'm hoping that each of us um, can go around and just say a few words of what we're hopeful for the future of civic engagement. Thanks, Maddie. This is Sarah. Yeah, so youth are our future and they're our future decision makers. So it's really important that we are helping youth with self-empowerment, which is a big the independent living philosophy through our centers for independent living um, to use their right to civic engagement and know that their vote is, is critical and can make a difference. But unfortunately, a lot of times marginalized youth disabilities, not only having disabilities, but have other identities as well, they're often discriminated against in multiple areas of their life. Um, and their voices are often shut down. And so how do we empower them to use their voice to vote when so often their voices have been shut down and may not believe that they can actually make a difference. There are challenges with youth. Um, a lot of youth are just learning how to self-advocate around the time that they, especially youth with disabilities, um, around the time that they are of age to vote. And so they may not know their rights to vote. What are their accommodations at the polls? Um, so it's important that we're also educating marginalized youth with disabilities, uh, not only about using their voices and empowering them, but also what are there accommodations when they're at the polls? And I can give a great personal example. Of, um, I know, Maddie, you've heard a little bit of my story, but when I turned 18 and went to the polls for the first time to vote, I was so excited and wanted to get my I vote sticker, um, but I didn't know what any of my rights were, know what any of my accommodations were. And when I got to the poll, I was in a manual wheelchair at the time, um, and the poll voter took me back away from my parents. I voted, but because I couldn't push myself in a manual chair, when I was done voting, I had no way to notify the poll worker that I was done. So I sat in the room for 15 minutes or so before finally she came in and checked on me. And I said, yes, I was done, but nobody 
to check on me. And so I just think about back to being 18 years old as a young person with a disability, if I had known what my accommodations were, all the modern technology that we're using with accessible um, devices, how different my experience would have been in that moment. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, something that someone mentioned earlier um, in the accessible voting panel was the importance of making sure that folks know not just the voters themselves, but the poll workers are becoming more and more educated about what folks' disabilities need and just to ask what assistance they need and really give that autonomy back to the voter to ensure that they're in control of their voting experience and offer a better result than, unfortunately, your first voting experience. Um, was. So for the sake of time, um, we're actually going to skip that final question and move on um, to some questions we have from folks here and on Zoom. Um, so this first question is for David. Um, one second. What are um, the current options for paratransit um, for folks who need to drop off ballots at the ballot box or um, at their elect supervisor of elections? Is there options for paratransit specific voting? <clears throat> really good question. So what I would recommend is, because um, each county is going to be different. Uh, so what I would say is uh, on our website at the Commission for Transportation Disadvantage, you can just Google that and it will be the first website that comes up. Uh, you can uh, identify what county you're uh, in and what our organizations that we work with are called Community Transportation Coordinators, or the acronym is CTC. I uh, recommend that you reach out to them and reach out to them early to identify what kinds of options they are providing in terms of um, uh, poll uh, visits, because they may have um, various types of options, uh, paratransit and maybe even public transit that would be available, um, you know, in terms of knowing where your polling place is and how you can be able to arrange that. So that would be um, my my first recommendation. And then, you know, beyond that, knowing, knowing how the service works, I mean, scheduling the time, you know, planning ahead, um, because, um, you know, oftentimes somebody may think that they can wait till the last second um, to, to schedule a trip. And some of them may have, uh, you know, waiting lists and, and the demand is so high. So it's good to identify those, I would say, early uh, to know if there's any kinds of limitations at the local level uh, in terms of the funding or in terms of uh, scheduling. So that would be some some options to consider. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to check in with Tony or other folks helping moderate the chat. Do we have any? Um, online chat. Maybe we have time for just one. Thanks, Maddie. This is Tony, uh, the chat moderator, and I was going to toss it to Lily Portman, one of our interns who had a question we received about uh, accessibility during campaign events and debates and otherwise. So, Lily, are you on? Yes, Tony. Thank you. The question is, is from, I think, Keith. He said, I am deaf, I'm a deaf resident and advocate for the deaf community. One thing I noticed, not too many understand the election process, like the difference between midterm elections and regular elections. During the debate or campaign, there was no sign language for the deaf or hard of, deaf hard of hearing community to obtain the communication accessibility. I once had to make a video explaining the process of primary and general elections. Yeah, thank you so much for that question online. So our next panel is actually all out running for office with a disability and the different barriers and necessities that we need to consider moving forward. So I think that would be a wonderful kind of transition um, out of this panel and to consider and offer up to our next panel um, as folks um, representing that panel have either run for office or um, are currently running for office or help folks with disabilities kind of navigate that space. And I think they'll maybe have really good insight into that. So with that, I just wanted to thank all of our panelists for being on today um, and for sharing your insight and wisdom with us. And um, 
Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we are going to break for lunch right now and we will reconvene at 12.30 p.m. Uh, I just wanna remind everybody that the comments and views of our panelists are their own and not necessarily those of Disability Rights Florida. Um, what, uh, what we're going to do now for our virtual audience is we're going to be playing a, uh, a couple of videos from a series uh, called Vote for Access. And if people with disabilities voted at the same rate as non-disabled voters, two million more votes would be cast. So we're getting in the way of disabled voters exercising their rights. That's what host Imani Barberin uncovers in Vote for Access, a five-part series addressing the problems with voting for people with disabilities and some solutions that everyone should know about. Protection and advocacy agencies in 15 states, including Disability Rights Florida, work together to create the Vote for Access series. Sharing expertise from around the country allowed the PNAs to investigate issues important to people with disabilities in a variety of communities. The videos were produced by Rooted in Rights and Block by Block Creative. We'll see you at 1230. Somebody else, and I have a right to vote just like everybody else. A young black woman with arm crutches stands in front of concrete pillars. Why is it important for people with disabilities to vote? Because we're voters and policies affect us. As disabled people, we often deal with stares and evasive questions. But have you ever thought that stereotypes and attitudes could impede our right to vote? My name is Amani Barbarin. I'm a disabled voter. And this is Vote for Access. Amani in the studio. Many of us with disabilities started our self-advocacy trying to convince those in our lives that we have every right to vote. Let's talk to Lawrence from North Carolina. Lawrence wearing dark glasses. Sometimes you have that, I'm sure they don't know what they're doing, whispers going on. Why is he coming to vote? He, he doesn't need to be here. He can't see, but he doesn't know what he's doing. Does he even know what he's voting for? Family members, caregivers, and even poll workers wrongly assume that people with intellectual or developmental disabilities can't understand the issues or make an informed choice. People have been turned away at the polls because of this harmful misconception. Let's hear from Rick from Alaska. Rick and an interpreter. One negative stereotype is that people think people with disabilities are not educated on politics. I am very educated on politics. Guardians can feel overwhelmed or don't see the point in helping disabled people they work with register to vote. As we think of ways to improve elections, we must prioritize access. Because of dismissive attitudes, many disabled voters aren't aware that there are accommodations available to us. I think sometimes people don't ask for accommodations because they assume it's going to come with maybe an eye roll or a judgment from a poll worker. My name is Star Dobush and I live in uh, Ashland, Ohio. I have dyslexia. In 2019 uh, was the first year I actually asked about accommodations. You know, I'm going to the library or I'm, and I'm requesting audiobooks or I'm going to the grocery store and I'm having someone tell me aloud what it is that is written on the screen. Why would I not have that same accommodation when I'm voting for our leaders? I figured I would just ask for um, the, the ballot to be read aloud to me. And it really helped me to solidify what I was voting on and understand what I was voting on. Providing accommodations for people with disabilities to vote is the law. It's not a partisan issue. It's not a choice. Lawrence. Ask me what I want instead of telling me what I want would go a long way toward understanding what I'm all about. Voting is participating. And in a country that often relegates disabled people to institutions, isolation, and stereotypes, participation is powerful. However, some folks just don't think disabled people should vote. I think those people should be quiet. We should be able to vote with the proper supports without misguided assumptions about our capacity.
Rick. I want the, the real, the real. I want politicians to realize that we are one third of the voting population. And that you need to hear what we have to say. Even your rideshare driver may question your desire to vote. That's if they don't cancel immediately after seeing your crutches or service animal. But that's a story for another feature length video. If you don't think disabled people should vote, hold that ableism inside. And if you're a disabled voter like me, stay firm and advocate for your right to vote. You have the right to private independent voting. You have the right to an accessible voting center that has an accessible voting machine available. You also have the right to bring someone to assist you. Most importantly, you have the right to vote. We could talk about voting all day, but what we want is to make inclusivity at the polls a priority for every election. We want disabled folks and non-disabled allies to fight for our vote together. Let's share resources and information to make voting easier for everyone. For specific information about the rights in your state and for advocacy resources, reach out to your state's protection and advocacy agency. Each state has a protection and advocacy agency that exists to protect the rights of people with disabilities. And keep watching this series at voteforaccess.us. Rick. This is Vote for Access. Information, it's everywhere. Dispersing through the invisible Wi-Fi signals, pinging through our modern world like Spider-Man's webs through New York. We now have more access to information than ever before. But for many people with disabilities, information can be inaccessible. This gap can prevent folks from making an informed decision on which candidate to vote for. My name is Imani Barbarin, I'm a disabled voter, and this is Vote for Access. Voting isn't a one day event. It's one part of an ongoing process where you first learn about the issues and candidates, then decide who or what you want to vote for, and watch as the results come in. You can't learn about the issues and candidates without access to information. Whether someone prefers to scroll through an online article or attend a community forum, everyone has the right to accessible information. The internet has gone through a lot of changes. We went from, you've got mail, to, this is fine, memes. Comic of a dog surrounded by flames saying, this is fine, with a smile. But accessibility on the internet is lagging behind. My name is Sasha Rangel. I currently live in Austin, Texas. There has just been a big problem with the access of information as, as it stands. The information has been available on a website, but it has been designed in a way that's rather tedious to navigate with uh, screen reader only software that I currently use to navigate everything on a computer. Small font, formatting that is unreadable by screen readers, flashing graphics, and videos without audio descriptions or captions make the internet inaccessible. It could feel like the Wild West, but with way less gold. There's no gold in these data mines. We don't often hear of informational inaccessibility until something goes wrong. Like when it was reported in July 2019 that not a single candidate's website was accessible according to web content accessibility guidelines. Let's hear from Bill from Florida. Bill wearing dark glasses. What we did was we analyzed each candidate's website uh, against the uh, worldwide standards in accessibility. We uh, had a few of the candidates reach out to us and they contacted us and they were like, well, wow, you know, uh, we, you know, we took a peek at this uh, um, meter report and uh, we know we have, we have a lot to, to do on our websites. What do we actually need to do? The fact that accessibility isn't considered first is a problem. The fact that it often isn't considered at all is unacceptable. Let's talk with Daylin from Arizona. Daylin signs while the voice actor speaks. Many videos from the candidates don't have closed captions. It's just a person speaking about what they want to tell you. You know, a little snippet. There's no closed captioning, no sign language. There's nothing to make that accessible. Maybe you could have a bubble on the screen and have the interpreter signing for these campaigns and these ads so a deaf person would have the same equal access as a hearing person. Quite frankly, as a deaf individual, I think it's the law. By not thinking through accessibility, you are leaving voters out. It's basically the bachelorette. You have a bunch of candidates to decide between, but you're not allowed to find out information on any of them because an access issue is interrupting to just stealing you for a minute. And it's not just access to candidates, but input into what the candidates focus on. The lives of people with disabilities are intimately affected by legislative changes. 
If the policies candidates are proposing directly affect your life, wouldn't you want to say? Let's talk with Madeline from Pennsylvania. I want to be engaged. I want to advocate for change. I want to be involved in the political sphere and advocate for myself so that things do improve. The state of policy is not good for people with disabilities. There's a lot of discrimination and we really need to advocate for better and improved laws and keep fighting for that. It's still very difficult for us to get any information about new policies that are coming up, policies that are going to be voted on. It's very difficult to find any of that information in an accessible um, place. Voting is about participating in democracy and making an informed choice. In order to make an informed choice, you have to have access to information. Don't know how to make your digital content accessible? Ironically, there's a lot of accessible information about how to do this on the internet. For specific information about the rights in your state and for advocacy resources, reach out to your state's protection and advocacy agency. Each state has a protection and advocacy agency that exists to protect the rights of people with disabilities. And keep watching this series at voteforaccess.us. Dalen, this is Vote for Access. Imagine this, it's election day. A young black woman with arm crutches walks down the street. You reach the candidates, you know where your polling place is, and you've arranged transportation. She stops and looks up at an enormous flight of stairs. Then you arrive at the polling center, nothing goes to plan, and you can't cast your vote. She shakes her crutch angrily. The truth of the matter is, you can plan for everything and still be met with inaccessibility at the polls. My name is Amani Barber, and I'm a disabled voter, and this is Vote for Access. Amani in the studio. The Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, has been in existence for decades and is designed to provide equitable access for people with disabilities. Since this law is the age of your average millennial, how come the ADA is less enforced than my student loan repayment plan? Amani purses her lips. In addition to the ADA, there are several laws. The Help America Vote Act, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Voting Accessibility for the Elderly and Handicapped Act of 1984, and National Voter Registration Act of 1993. These laws already demand that voters with disabilities have the right to accessible, private, and independent voting. However, come voting day, this often isn't the case. Let's hear from Parmi from Alabama about their day at the polls. I need um, accommodations that are accessible and operable. And when I say accessible, I mean that when I get there, if there is a machine there that has print on it, I'm not able to see what the print is. So I would need to know what is on the screen. On several occasions when I've gotten to a polling precinct, uh, the machines are somewhat still in the box, not plugged up, and I've actually been told that they were not going to turn them on. I have uh, poll workers that are not sure how to utilize the machines, um, the automark specifically, to help me vote on the machine when I get there. And sometimes I even have poll workers that stand behind me while I'm voting and they're watching the screen as well. Voting with the need for accommodation can be a gamble when you consider all that is out of your control. Legally, polling places are required to be accessible, so it can be done to improve access. There are several things that should be considered for polling places to be accessible. The space should be physically accessible, with safe ramps available. Accessible parking and access to transit should also be prioritized. If you have an invisible disability, having seating available while you wait is super important. Some places have an option called curbside voting. It's a drive through for voting. It doesn't fix the problem of having an inaccessible polling place, but if it's staff, and easy to locate, it can add another option for access. Accessible voting units, or AVUs, allow voters to make selections in a variety of ways. The machines need to be set up properly, in a place with privacy and poll workers need to know how to use them. They should also offer the use of the accessible voting unit to all voters. For example, a voter with dyslexia may prefer to use an AVU to listen to ballot information rather than reading. Good poll worker training can make inaccessible spaces more accessible. I'm Chris Swope. I'm the city clerk for the city of Lansing. Michigan got all new equipment just a couple years ago, so it was a different piece of equipment. The poll workers hadn't used it as much, hadn't had as many uh, voters come through and use it and we started to get feedback from a couple of voters that they felt discouraged from using it, and that was the last thing we wanted. If those people that are there to assist a voter through the voting process don't feel confident or seem confident uh, with a part of the process or a piece of the equipment, um, it doesn't instill confidence in the voter. Although 60 to 70 percent of polling places are inaccessible, there's no national outrage or even awareness. Eric from Michigan spent years trying to vote and it was finally successful. And I was inside the polling location 
and they said they had the auto voting machine, but all they had was the headphones and the MIDI controllers. They did not have the device for me. And I was like, that's it. I'm like, I'm not, that's it. I'm not going to do it. Eric in his power chair in front of an AVU. As you can see, that's the machine. I mean, it wasn't even plugged in. I was finally able to vote private and independently 20 or 21 years later. The longest anyone who wants to vote should have to wait is the 18 years we all have to wait in America. If you can't get to a polling center, you can contact local officials to ask for assistance. Options like the election protection hotlines and reaching out to your local protection and advocacy agency can provide you with support on election day. Dial 866-R-VOTE. Dial 866-687-8683. Amani on the phone. Hello, yes. I need some help. It's a hot mess here right now. And keep watching this series at voteforaccess.us. Eric. This is Vote for Access. The United States is a vast country. A young black woman with arm crutches stands near an open field. Voters in rural areas sometimes have to travel for hours to get to a polling center. Barriers like distance, lack of transportation, and institutionalization can't keep voters with disabilities from the polls. There are some alternatives like mail-in ballots or early voting, but they aren't always available or accessible. So how can we increase accessibility for those who can't make it to the polls? My name is Amani Barber and I'm a disabled voter and this is Vote for Access. Amani in the studio. For voters in rural areas, accessing a polling center can be difficult. I'm uh, Morris Brewer. I'm an enrolled member of the Ogallala Lakota tribe. We have a reservation of about 65 miles wide by a little over 100 miles long. There's nine districts here, so there are a lot of challenges just for the geographical distances we have to cover. We live in uh, one of the most poverty-stricken counties in the whole United States. So people don't have the money for gas to get to where they're going. Anything that would make it more accessible for them to to vote is, I think, the key. So, if getting to the polls is difficult for many voters, why not bring the polls to us? That's the idea behind mail-in ballots. My name is uh, Celine Jones. One thing about one of my disabilities is that I can't um, be out in the cold for too much. Um, I had to think, okay, do I have enough um, do I have enough food with me? Do I have all of those things prepared? What's the weather going to be like? Do I have my asthma medication? So when I had to vote in person in Ohio, I had to think about those things. Again, in Washington, now that we're entirely vote by mail, think about the important things like, oh, I need to research this issue. I need to research that issue. Oh, I want to know more about that candidate and that sort of thing. Because I don't have to think, I don't have to take up the mental space thinking about the logistics of getting to the polling place. But paper has its problems, and paper mail-in ballots don't work for everyone. For example, if you need assistance to fill out your mail-in ballot, your vote may no longer be private or independent. Low vision voters will need large print. Blind voters may need braille or audio versions in order to access the ballot. Let's discuss accessible voting options with Michelle Bishop, through the National Disability Rights Network. So we're really thinking through new ways for people to vote by mail, and I'm really excited about some of them. Some states like Oregon, Maryland are looking at um, electronic delivery of a blank ballot. I can get a link emailed to me. I can pull up that ballot on my device at home. So if I need any type of assistive technology to access it, uh, and I have that there, or I have access to it, you know, at work or at my local library, then I can complete my ballot that way and I can still fill it out privately and independently. Voters with disabilities also live in institutions and may need facility support and organizational support to vote. Invasion of privacy can be a problem when voting within an institution. How would you vote with someone watching? Someone leans over Amani's shoulder. Are you just gonna linger there or what? But it doesn't have to be this way, especially if staff create a supportive environment. My name is Timothy Blaine Carnes, and I vote every time I can. Well, presently I live in Weston, West Virginia. Uh, it's a uh, behavioral health facility. All the staff that I've came in contact with have very, been very helpful and very supportive in my uh, uh, ambition to vote. Uh, my ballot comes in the mail. I have my own table in a corner when I vote. I have no one behind me and they, they stay their distance and I let them know when I'm finished. I vote, I put it in one envelope and then into another double sealed for safety and I mail it off to the county clerk's office. It's counted, I'm happy. 
In addition to nursing home facilities and psychiatric facilities, jails and prisons are also institutions that house people with disabilities. Around 40 to 60 percent of individuals in U.S. jails have a disability. For those in jail who are awaiting trial, their voting rights are still intact. But is the jail required to provide you with a way to vote? That's iffy. Some facilities do make the effort in collaboration with the protection and advocacy system. Let's hear from Jordan about voting from a Seattle jail. Jordan wearing dark glasses. First, I, I never knew that I could vote while I was in jail. That was my first meeting with um, Disability Rights of Washington. I asked if I would be interested in um, voting on an ABU, an ABU um, that is accessible to someone with my disability. So not only could I vote, but I can vote with the same dignity and privacy that any other citizen that would have. And it's important for folks with disabilities to have access to vote because your vote is your voice. With increasing options to vote beyond the polls, we need policymakers to consider our community of disabled voters before proposing changes, not after. There are solutions for those of us who can't make it to the polls. Get tips for self-advocacy from your state's protection and advocacy agency. Each state has a protection and advocacy agency that exists to protect the rights of people with disabilities. And keep watching this series at voteforaccess.us. Morris. This is Vote for Access. Okay, everyone, we're going to get started again. Um, I would like to introduce to you Laura Lee Minatello, who is Disability Rights Florida, excuse me, Voting Access Coordinator. And um, I, I'm sorry, Laura is Disability Rights Florida Voting Access Advocate and Outreach Coordinator, also a member of the Access to Vote Coalition. And she is here to introduce our keynote speaker. Thanks, Robin. And hi, everyone. Um, are you all enjoying yourselves? I'm enjoying myself. I have the distinct privilege and honor to introduce to you our keynote speaker, who I feel like needs no introduction, but just by way of a quick introduction, um, Emily Bordy is the current um, Associate Director at Nuco Strategies and previously worked as an Associate Director in the White House in the Office of Public Engagement. Uh, she has a diverse background. She was an educator and she has two master's degrees, um, one in public policy and one in public policy, or one in education and one in public policy education. Um, she also worked on, worked with um, Pete Buttigieg and his husband Chastin as Chastin's body woman and trip director and was the first visibly disabled staffer in the in a presidential primary ever. So rather than listen to me drone on about how amazing she is, uh, I'm just going to hand it over to Emily. Thank you so, so, so much, Laura Lee, um, for that very kind introduction. Um, I am so grateful to be with you all here today um, and with those of you that are here uh, virtually as well. Uh, I will bring uh, um, the folks at my table in the back uh, that despite having grown up in Northern Indiana, I absolutely love warm weather. <laughs> and so thank you for giving me an excuse to what has already felt like the first kind of week of fall uh, in Northern Indiana, the chilly fall mornings back home. So thank you. Uh, as Lori Lee mentioned, my name is I'm Lordy. To give a brief visual description, I am a white woman, uh, short of stature, sitting in a manual wheelchair. Uh, I have blonde, just past shoulder length hair, and today I'm wearing a blue and white striped dress. The context provided in my bio is certainly helpful for understanding what I've done. I wanted to start by sharing just a little bit about who I am, uh, all in the hopes of, of directing you to a, a point I'd like to make today, and that is about the importance of storytelling. So I am the daughter of a retired local public servant and critical care nurse. I'm the sister of a brilliant Brooklyn-based IT professional, 
friend of 22 years name is also Emily. I was um, a born and raised vegetarian. I have a condition that causes my bones to break easily. Every year at about this time, I try to pick up knitting as a hobby. Uh, and despite the years and years of practice, I still not make, make much more than a scarf, uh, but it suits me well in Indiana. Uh, part of my heart remains on the Mississippi Gulf Coast with my former second grade students that I taught. For seven years, I played pickup basketball with an all men's wheelchair basketball team. Uh, given the fact that my bones break easily, as I mentioned, that I had to hang that up after those seven years. Uh, I recently met uh, the nanny's Fran Drescher, which is a new fun fact that I have. And the first time that I voted, like many of you in this room, my polling place wasn't accessible. So let me tell you the story. As I mentioned, and I, I grew up in a family of locally elected officials. My father was an elected in our mid-sized Indiana town, as was my grandfather and my great-grandfather. I spent many of my childhood Friday nights at church fish fries and my Saturday nights passing out campaign literature at Elks Lodge uh, card parties. When I was six years old, my dad was up for re-election, and I vividly remember begging him from our campaign headquarters to let me pick up the phone in phone bank convinced that I knew my dad better than anybody else. So why shouldn't I be able to call voters and, and convince them to vote for him? My grandma, Therese, passed away at the age of 96, held a claim to fame that she, that has been told and retold in our family, that she never once missed voting in an election, big or small. So you get the picture, public service and civic engagement more broadly uh, was and is a family affair. So you can only imagine the anticipation that I felt as a newly minted 18 year old in high school, preparing to vote for the very first time. A rite of passage that I had waited for for so, so, so long. My excitement grew when a young local leader came to speak to my AP government class, not about his candidacy for local office, but instead about the importance of serving one's community and the power of one's vote. Voting was, is cool and I was finally and it was finally my turn to participate. I can still picture the day very vividly. The mid-morning sky was in overcast. I made a voting plan and I traveled with my dad to our precinct polling place, a church just around the corner from my house. I had been to this location times before, uh, both to accompany one or both of my parents to vote or uh, once before to volunteer on election day. But this time, voters were being directed up a half flight of stairs at the mouth of the church instead of around through the multi-purpose room entrance that was accessible and that was traditionally, uh, in my experience at least, uh, had been reserved for election day. Now again, I use the manual wheelchair for those of you that can't see perhaps under the table garment. Uh, so my chair and I uh, weren't particularly thrilled with the sight of the stairs, but I was convinced that be a ramp. There must be a way to access the side entrance. My call it naive or call it optimistic, uh, 18 brain thought so at least. But the precinct captain sheepishly told me that there was no ramp. Not only the side entrance could not be accessed, could only be accessed, I'm sorry, with a key that no one on site had access to. My options were slowly dwindling here. Now I'm sure, as I mentioned at the top, Many of us in this room have been faced with a similar inflection point. We've talked about them just here today. In that moment, I could plop myself down on the stairs church, scoot up them, and ask my dad to bring my chair along, or I could turn around and give up. There's nothing fair or equitable or democratic position that I was placed in. My ability to exercise my constitutional right rested upon just that, my ability. The ability of my disabled body to compensate for the structural ableism that I was experiencing. The ability of my body to muster the strength to steer itself from stair to stair, knowing full well that other disabled peers wouldn't have been able to make that same decision. Others wouldn't have been able to take themselves up the stairs. And what's more, my non-disabled peers never would have been put in that position in the first place. My on that May day was not and is not 
lost on me. So I committed to two things, telling my story and making my vote count. First, the latter. One of the votes I would cast on that May morning was for the young leader who had visited my US government some months before. The man that would ultimately become my mayor and then my boss, and now the Secretary of Transportation, the judge. Fewer than 10 years after I cast my very first church, my very first vote in that church on the corner of Ironwood and Corby, I joined Pete Buttigieg's campaign for president of the United States. I would serve as the 2020 primary's first staffer with a mobility disability and the first ever person with a mobility disability to travel full time on the campaign trail as what's called a, a body woman, essentially a, a, a staffer for the candidate, or in my case, the candidate's spouse. As often as I could, I told my story, not only just about the structural barriers at the that day, but stories about barriers I faced day in and day out that I had for so long internalized as products of my own limitations, as products of the in, inaccessible world in which I lived. I committed myself to amplifying the stories of other disabled friends and neighbors. Why? Because I had a choice that day. As a white person, as a person with access to a photo ID, as someone with the physical ability to get out of my scoop up those stairs, I was able to exercise my right to vote. But that was not the case for so many others, but just as much right uh, as the vote. So what is my point and why am I telling you this story? A story in some ways that is familiar to every single person, both in this room and online with us virtually. Because I believe I know that telling our stories is often more critical than any amount of policy wonk. And don't get me wrong, data, strong talking points, knowing your rights, formal lobbying, fundraising, everything are critical. But the soul of issues lie in telling stories about the unjust, inaccessible scenarios we accommodate around each and every day as people with disabilities. During the better part of 2021 and 2022, I had the opportunity to amplify the story of disabled stories of disabled activists as the White House Office of Public Engagement's liaison to disabled Americans. In July of 2021, Vice President Kamala Harris reached to request an in-person meeting with disabled advocates from around the country issue of voter access. Less than a week later, le less than a week later, eight people with disabilities, ranging from mobility disabilities, visual disabilities, hearing disabilities, developmental disabilities, mental health diagnoses, gathered in the vice president's ceremonial room to talk candidly with her about the barriers that they were experiencing at the polls. Uh, one of those people today, uh, or that was there today, is here with us today, uh, Olivia Babis, um, who I met uh, in that, on that um, 2020, I'm sorry, July 2021 day. The stories that were told in that ceremonial room were carried with the vice president throughout, uh, throughout the, the, or continue to be carried oh, with the president, uh, throughout her time, uh, both in you know, closed door conversations uh, and in formal speeches. Um, she obviously is prepped with the details that she needs from her staff, the facts, the statistics uh, about disabled uh, folks' right to vote. But what she, no policy wonk, no staffer is able to equip her with is the stories that she heard in that ceremonial room that day, the stories, again, that we share, that we hold uh, here in this room today. So I want you to know that that moment while we met in the ceremonial room was far from ceremonial, but indeed impacted the work and continues to impact the work uh, that the vice president and others on her team do to this day. Though I have since left the White House and have begun a new journey uh, with a, a political consulting firm called Nuco Strategies, I understand the value, the importance of humanizing the injustice that we see in this world, about bringing our stories to the forefront, uh, to put a face to the barriers uh, that others uh, often might take for granted. I wanna end with one caveat, that I know that sharing our stories is tiresome. 
there is a lot of energy, emotional energy, physical energy, uh, spiritual energy, mental energy that goes in to telling our stories time and time and time again. But I'm here to tell you that I am certainly with you in that journey. I encourage you, uh, as so many of you do already, now and down the road, particularly as we prepare uh, for the general election to continue telling your stories about the ways in which this world, whether knowingly or unknowingly, uh, creates barriers to your access, particularly in access to the right to vote. Uh, so with that, I want to thank you. I have a little bit more time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have or listen as you practiced sharing those stories. Uh, but know as we move forward after today, that we continue to be an ally alongside of you, a, a peer alongside of you in this fight for access to the vote. Um, can pass this in along later, but I can be found on uh, Twitter, uh, which though oft feels like an echo chamber, I assure you it's a great place to share your story, uh, a great place to uh, process some of the, the trauma and inaccessibility that we face day in and day out. Um, I'm, I'm also also available by email and I'm happy to pass that along too, whether it be if you need a listening ear, uh, whether it be somebody, you need somebody to look over an op-ed that you're hoping to push out in your community about your access to the vote, uh, a Twitter thread, whatever it may be, um, know that I am here alongside of you in that journey and really look forward to staying connected to you all uh, here in Florida that are doing this work. So thank you so, so much. All right, thank you so much, Emily. We appreciate you. All right, I'd like to ask the uh, panelists from our fourth and final panel to go ahead and make your way up to the table uh, while I introduce the next segment. So the final panel today is titled, My Elected Official Doesn't Look Like Me, Running for Office as a Person with a Disability. In this panel, we feature elected officials with disabilities individuals who have run for office, and those who are increasing the visibility of, of disabled candidates. They will share their perspectives on the importance of disability representation in elected officials. I'd like to introduce our moderator for the panel, Danielle McGill, who is the Advocacy Coordinator at the Ann Stork Center and a member of the Access to Vote Florida Coalition. Hello everyone. I hope you guys are having a wonderful time and learning about, um, this afternoon. My name is Danielle McGill and my pronouns are she and her. And um, I'm blonde hair. Um, I have cerebral palsy and I wear pink. I'm wearing a pink and um, black polka dot shirt. And um, it's a pleasure and honor to be your moderator for this section. Um, this section is about um, elected officials with disabilities as well as those who have run for office or who are increasing the visibility of candidates with disabilities by coming together for a conversation on the importance of disability representation in elected officials. Um, and I would like to open up to the panelists to um, to introduce themselves and their work and the area of expertise as, as well as any experiences they would like to share. Hello, my name is Carolyn Campbell. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am a female with um, straight-ish here, long. I'm um, wearing basically black and, uh, with a jacket. I'm legally blind. Um, uh, 
first blind elected official. Hi, I'm Natalie Alden, and um, I'm a C5 quadriplegic. I have long, dark hair. I'm wearing dark blue. Um, I have been an elected official in Craig, Colorado, and I'm actually running for city council in my local district. Uh, I haven't put my paperwork in. Um, I really appreciate the fact that I do have support from my my employment to do it. And so um, it's it's a scary process to go back through. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. This is Sarah Blahovic. Um, I'm joining virtually today. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. And I am a white woman with short brown hair, wearing glasses and um, I am in front of a virtual background that is filled with books. I am the creator of or co-creator of Elevate Campaign Training with Disabilities and have worked um, on issues around running for office with a disability, um, both in terms of getting more people with disabilities to run for office and, and some of the, the barriers that come up. So I am happy to be joining today. Uh, sorry. Carolyn again. Um, also forgot to mention the aspects of things that I'm involved with. Uh, League of Women Voters, um, or County, or Central Florida, uh, National Federation of the Blind, um, also a federal employee. Um, my background is in sustainability engineering. Thank you. Now I would like to open up uh, this question for all of our panelists. Um, what barriers exist to running for office as a person with disability and dis discuss the ways to successfully overcome them? What have you guys faced? You want to go first? Okay. Uh, this is Carolyn. Um, some of the barriers that I found, one of the basic barriers is that a lot of entities, because you have to go online and prove who you are, both on Facebook and when you create a candidate website, um, a lot of online locations did not know what a Florida ID was. They accepted a Florida driver's license, being legally blind, don't have one. So that was a challenge, having to find who to come Act to be able to tell them that this is a legitimate ID and that this is because it kept coming back that it was it, it wasn't legitimate, that it was expired, that all of these various problems because it did not recognize it. I've also found that a lot of buildings, public buildings that you go into, city of you know, various cities, various county buildings, they are able to scan a driver's license. But if you give them an ID, a Florida, you know, state of Florida ID, you do not know what to do with it. It does not scan. Uh, so something simple like just not using a driver's license caused significant problems with websites and being able to have a site, being able to have a Facebook page, because if you don't have those various things, you can't even go out for funding. You can't even tell people who you are. And so that was a significant bur burden and a significant hurdle just to even get started. Thank you. Ooh, I wanna I want to interject here. We have another panelist who's on here virtually, Kara Tucker. Um, she did not get a chance to share her introduction. So I just wanted to make sure she could. Thank you. Uh, I'm Karen Tucker. I am from, I'm a Jacksonville native, grew up in Neptune Beach. I served on the city council in Neptune Beach from 2008 to 2016. My background, I was born with three, po three pounds, three ounces, diagnosed with cerebral palsy at um, six months. And I walk with a walker. Um, today I have a green dress on with curls and I have long brown hair. And, and my undergrad is in sociology with a degree in rehabilitation counseling from the University of North Florida. I also did postgraduate work in uh, and rehabilitation leadership and management at Auburn University. I currently uh, serve as the Chief of Disabled Services and ADA Coordinator for the City of Jacksonville and advocate for individuals with disabilities in 
in Jacksonville on a daily basis and staff the Disability Council and the Hispanic American Advisory Board. I look forward to sharing the rest of my story as we go through the panel today. Thank you. Thank you, Kara, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I want to ask you, um, panelists, do you guys face any um, social security or benefits or ableism while you try to run for office? So, so I'll say that, um, you know, going back to the first question as far as barriers, um, you know, being a C5 quad, having the mobility issue, um, when I was in Craig, Colorado, one of the big things was most of the places, you know, like, this will show the rural rurality of it. Uh, the local feed store that everybody went to did not have access. If I needed to go to the store, they're like, somebody would come out and say, hey, what do you need? They go in and get it. I pay for them at the that kind of thing. And um, so, so doing, you know, like debates or going out and talking to people was a big barrier in itself. I had somebody with me because it's not like I can go up and knock on someone's door. Um, if there's a step to their door, it's not like I can come and say, oh, hey, come for me. Yes. So vol having volunteers that are able to do those portions for you, even if you're staying at the street level and they're walking up and knocking on the door and saying, hey, if you want to know more, if she's out here, she'd be more than happy to talk to you, um, I, I think is, is a big thing. Um, when I was on city council back in Colorado, uh, Social Security was an issue. Um, that particular city council position did have a have pay. You know, um, it was only one hundred and fifty nine dollars a month, but it still was a. And for all those who know about Social Security, it doesn't take much for it to affect your check. And so it really was an offset because of the type of benefit it was, and it didn't prevent me. But I could see where. Some individuals, depending on the state and the municipality, that you, it could be a bigger barrier. And I, I would say to anybody who's thinking about running for office who is receiving Social Security, get a benefit plan done to find out exactly how the type of income you would receive from that elected position is going to impact you to make that decision before you put in your paperwork, before you start going down that path. Because you wouldn't want somebody coming back at the end of being like, Oh, and now you lose your benefits. That's great. Advice. Yes. Um, if, if I can interject here. Um, so I, I haven't run for office, but I've worked on this issue pretty um, substantially. Um, so the Social Security Administration uh, previously hadn't said anything around running for office and disability. I reached out to them in 2021 to ask how this would impact after several disabled people had reached out to me. Um, and they look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, but the problem is, is that they, if what you are doing on the campaign trail um, is seen as a sign of medical improvement and going against your evaluation of how you are disabled, they may use that even though you are just a candidate, you are not earning money um, as a candidate personally. Uh, they may use that as a sign of medical improvement and reduce or eliminate your benefits. That's even before getting an elected office. And it's a massive problem. I know of people who have run for office um, who have lost their benefits because of this. Um, there are also some people who haven't, because again, it's very individual. Um, but the good news, if there is any here, is that Senator Bob Casey of Pennsylvania um, put out legislation um, and introduced legislation in July. Uh, it's Senate Bill 4595. That's a very long title, um, but it's a very short piece of legislation. And what it would do is uh, exempt campaign activities from being seen as a sign of medical improvement used in disability evaluations or seen as substantial gainful activity. Um, he also put out another package of or another piece of legislation, uh, the Aid and Local Government um, Leadership Act. Actually, that one's Senate Bill 4595. The one I mentioned on Social Security is 4597. Um, but that would provide um, funds to lower income and rural um, governments to provide accommodations to elected officials with disabilities. So providing basically a fund to help pay for those. Um, so those are two pieces of legislation I really encourage everyone to look up, but that's just the start 
of the issues around social security and running for office, as my co-panelists mentioned, um, even a small salary, even though even if it falls under the two thousand dollar asset cap, um, could be a problem, and you could end up um, triggering, you know, a social security review or a reduction of benefits. That's something that needs to be changed. Unfortunately, even unpaid work, as we we see here, even a, an unpaid elected office. Um, uh, is is uh, something that could uh, trigger issues with your your benefits. So we also need to look at um, legislation like the um, oh God, I, I can't remember the name of it exactly, and I will have to look it up and and mention it later. But there's bipartisan legislation by the um, senators from Ohio to increase the SSI asset cap to ten thousand for individuals and twenty thousand for um, couples that is a good start as well so that people um, don't don't experience those limits as well. Um, and someone asked, can we repeat the House bill numbers? Um, so the S, uh, Senate Bill 4597 is the one that would address the social security issue. And S 4595 are, um, that is the Aid and Local Government Leadership Act, which would set up a um, fund for accommodating uh, disabled local elected officials. Thank you so much, Sarah, because the, you have a very critical point about losing benefits and how it could affect uh, getting a review and so forth. That's a big critical part um, in the disability, disability community. And that's one of our biggest fears is losing benefits and it affects our whole livelihood for some of us. Um, now I would like to go on a lighter note. Um, what is the most positive thing to come out of your candidacy as a person with a disability? And what is the most negative thing to come out of your candidacy as a person with a disability? Kara, did you want to go first? Sure. The in regards to the the social security um, benefits, I wasn't um, I wasn't on benefits at the time, but I know that it is an issue, and I have been following the legislation that uh, that was discussed. And I know as far as one of the barriers that was for me with my um, two victorious campaigns and my last race in 2016 when I ran for mayor um, was my mobility issues and being able to go door to door. So I agree with you, Natalie, in regards to being able to have a team if you work with local colleges and get volunteers that are able to go help you go door to door, because I know now golf carts and, you know, the wheelchairs and all different types of technology, you know, with Zoom, I know in 2020, the individuals that ran were able to use Zoom and the different technology and Facebook Live to get their messages out and have, you know, be able to do direct mail to get your message out. So there's different ways that you're able to do that. Um, in regards to a positive thing that came out of out of my candidacy and serving the eight years that I did and being able to advocate at the state level while I served on council um, with vocational rehab would be um, being a stronger advocate and being able to stand up um, for myself more and for others and to be able to be that voice that was definitely and try to break those barriers to be like, look, oh, she has a disability. Sometimes individuals forget um, that I have a disability until I am not able to get in somewhere or, you know, going to and from restaurants or just you know regular office meetings or have to walk a long distance in the heat um, that's where you know sometimes that that can be an issue but I think um, negatively um, there's still sometimes where people just can't sometimes can't see past the disability so I think that that's where um, and they they assume things and if they don't know information they'll sometimes make it up so I think that that's where but that's for anybody that's running for office when you put yourself out there um, just making sure you stay on message. And one thing um, also with the positive and negative, um, make sure that you have your family um, there to support you as well, because the whole family runs for office. So if you have a spouse, if you have kids, um, older kids, young kids, all of the whole family runs when you run for office. This is Carolyn regarding um, positive aspects, uh, as was mentioned, um, representation, uh, basically being an advocate and being a representative of the disability community, because a lot of people are still not used to that. And I think that's that's key. That's important to have more of us out there 
um, to represent the disability community and people with different disabilities and to show that it's a spectrum so that people understand that disability is no matter what disability you have, it's a spectrum. Uh, the aspect I think that um, was also mentioned, some of the, you know, being that representative uh, and, and having that was able to also show some of the challenges that we have. So that was part of representation and being with the legally blind community, a lot of things, you know, it was mentioned about door to door. If you can't see the door, it makes it difficult to do door to door. <laughs> um, other aspect is that a lot of the vote, you know, the, the, the call people to vote type situations, a lot of them are accessible because they're on a computer. And so if you don't have, if it doesn't work with your accessible software, as was mentioned, it's good to have volunteers to help out with. Regarding negative aspects, um, it was a challenge regarding transportation, um, being able to get from point A to point B from various, you know, candidate events, et cetera, to be able to get the word out there. Uh, that was certainly a big deal. And Another another one was basically that you know we, we all face negativity and we all face as you know when you're running you all face that the plus or the minus being on the, the disability community I think we have a thicker skin so uh, we're, we've been we've been bullied we've been faced negative stuff all our lives so call me names I'm used to that oh well you know big deal <laughs> so uh, I think that was actually a good and a bad thing. Um, and basically, you know, it's 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 just it's important that that with the representation, people understand some of the challenges that we face. And I think the more that we talk about it, the more that it erases those barriers for other people to be able to run. Thank you. So this is Natalie. And, and you know, as far as positive things, I think when, when I was elected in Craig, one of the greatest thing is within that first week of being elected, there was a ramp at the feed store. And there was a ramp that went up behind where all of the council members sat. And it, I didn't have to say a word, you know, just seeing my chair and knowing that I'm now one of your city council people was enough for a lot of businesses to be like, oh, I guess we should put a ramp out. I guess we should be able to make it where the city council person can actually come into our business. I, I think that was one of the biggest impacts. And the fact that I didn't have to advocate for it, I didn't, you know, just simply running for office and them seeing that you have some of the disability was enough for them to say, hey, we're, we're going to do something about it. And as far as negative, I really didn't have any negative experiences um, being on council. I thought that, you know, uh, one of the things I was really happy about is that there were within the city, like at the sheriff's department and, you know, and, and the management, it, and it didn't matter. They would come and seek me out to ask about ability issues. You know, they would be very much proactive about wanting to know, hey, what, what can we do to make this better? And I really didn't see a negative aspect to it. I think negative as far as running for a campaign, I think that, you know, that perception that because we have a disability that we're not going to be able to keep up we're not going to be able to do you know what, what what we're there for for and i think that's probably a fear for a lot of us as well as something that negatively impacts people wanting to run for counts running run for any elected position so basically you're saying is that we defeat the misconceptions yes and that's what we have to do we have to, we have to, in every step of the way, we have to push past it and, you know, show them that, that, you know, I mean, I own my disability. I know I'm a C5 quad. You know, I, if somebody were to say, oh, well, don't vote for her because she's a, she's disabled. And I, and <laughs> if that's the best you can come up with. It's pretty slim. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. So one of the, that I had um, happen in my in my last race when I ran for mayor, they they said, oh, she won't be able to work with the the city council members downtown, and oh, she won't be able to stay at the emergency operations center. Um, 
to during the storms and we need somebody that can be able to do that well I can come and go as I please I can stay away from home for more than 24 hours and that was you know with letter letters to the editor in regards to it and the irony now is a few years later now I am the person that works with the city council and the and the mayor's administration to advocate for people with disabilities to make sure they have that effective communications and that the shelters are accessible so I'm there and the person that I ran against isn't always there so you know it's just it's just one of those things you just have to work through it and you know even with my time on the community development board before I got on council advocating you know for for disabled parking spaces and to make sure that the buildings are accessible I think that that's also important important to get involved at any level but we'll talk about that again in a few minutes thank you for sharing that Kara now this question is for Sarah can you um, please talk a, a, a bit about the training you have developed and for folks that are interested in running for office and access other resources? Yes. Um, so I um, co-created Elevate Campaign Training for People with Disabilities at the National Council on Independent Living, which I recently left actually last week. Um, but th those trainings are still available. We created it in 2019 um, to address a need in the campaign training space. Uh, first, uh, there, there's a lot of campaign trainings out there, um, but none of them were created with accessibility in mind. So um, making sure that we had screen reader, accessible materials, quality captioning, um, uh, ASL interpreters we added in 2021. Um, so looking at all of those aspects of how do we make the campaign training itself accessible to people with disabilities and then make the content tailored to the disability community as much as possible, which is obviously a big challenge. Um, the challenges that disabled people face as elected officials varies from person to person um, because disability is such a different experience for each person. Um, but we tried to do the best we could with addressing both um, the actual barriers in terms of I don't, I don't want to say physical barriers, but the, the access barriers. Um, and then also the issues of prejudice and ableism, how to address that on the campaign trail. Um, as I said, those trainings, they're, they're, they're for first time candidates, um, ideally first time local candidates. Uh, they are available for free on the NICL website, uh, which is ncil.org uh, slash elevate. And I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, so you can access the 2019 and 2021 trainings there. Um, I'll also put another website um, or another page from Nickel on there. Um, there are many other campaign trainings, as I mentioned, and they are tailored to many different things. It could be your political party. Um, it could be a certain aspect of your identity. There are trainings tailored towards candidates of color, uh, the LGBT community um, to, to women. So there are many different organizations out there that are um, offering resources to you to learn how to run for office. And part of my work um, is continuing to work with those organizations so that they become more accessible. We don't just want a disability campaign training program. We want every training program to be accessible and inclusive of our community. Um, so I'll put that page as well. It's also on the NICL website at ncil.org slash run hyphen for hyphen office. Um, and while I'm no longer at Nickel, I am uh, looking towards the future of continuing and expanding this campaign training work. Uh, I think there is a really big need for it. It is very important to provide resources to our community and to work with these other programs to become more accessible and inclusive. Um, so I am excited to be continuing that. Thank you, Sarah, and I'm pretty sure that people online and as well as people here are going to check out your resources and information that you'll be providing us today. Um, this will se segue into the next question. This is for all panelists, is what avenues exist to promote the candidacy of people with disabilities or how can we create and solidify pathways 
for people with disabilities to run for office? This is Natalie. I would I would say the biggest thing is, you know, grassroots advocacy, letting people know all comes down to, and we said this earlier, nothing about us without us. Um, I think the more that you can show people with disabilities how important it is to be involved at all levels of government, you know, it it really impacts their lives and and all of the other people's lives with disabilities. It's like I've sat on a lot of different boards and councils and stuff throughout my year, um, you know, and and some of them disability related, some of them not disability related. And I think that, you know, we have to be working with each other to let each other know, hey, you can do this. Let's get you involved. Um, I do a lot of mentoring when I meet people with um, disabilities that seem like they want to get involved. They have a lot of energy. They have a lot of passion. And I'm like, hey, well, did you ever think about finding out what kind of boards and commissions are available? You can go on your city's website and you can look, you know, um, I have a buddy of mine who's on the waterways commission, you know, and because he's on there and he has a disability, he's been able to bring that disability aspect to our Jacksonville waterways. And, you know, and, and so I think sometimes we think that it's just disability and we don't realize that bringing our disability with us to engage at all levels really helps everyone. It helps constituents with, constituents with disabilities in your area as well. The, um, this is Kara, I absolutely agree. I think all politics is local, you know, with, with serving on mine, you know, it was, a 2.5 mile city, I started getting involved with, you know, when I was in Girl Scouts and working my way up in high school, I joined the teen advisory board for our local supervisor elections and became one of the youngest poll workers to be a precinct manager and ran my own precinct for eight years um, and then tried to learn the, all the different ins and outs of the process, you know, getting involved in community development review boards, um, you know, different if it was different political party work, different campaigns, middle school, high school, college, you know, just getting to learn the whole different process. Um, and, and we have different, in Jacksonville, we have different boards um, that are based on, you know, to, like we have the Disability Council, we have the Hispanic Board, we have development review boards, all different types of things. If it's for nationality, there's, there's a group for everyone to be able to come share their voice. Um, with Jacksonville being so big geographically, we have different, um, CPAC meetings that you can go and learn about the different things that are going on in your different neighborhoods. There's HOAs, there's multiple ways that you can get involved and, and share your voice at any level. You know, there's disability organizations. So I think all of that um, definitely does help. And like, like the guest speaker said earlier, you know, making sure that we share our stories and that we're there for each other as well. This is Carolyn. Um, I echo what was uh, said by both Nat Natalie and Kara, um, as was also mentioned, volunteering, being involved with as many things as possible. Um, if if there is a position that you're looking to do or you're looking to run for, start volunteering with those organizations. Start possibly shadowing, being a mentee of a person who has run for office so that you're learning from them. I think it was very beneficial to volunteer and work with the person that was already in office. And that taught me a lot about what to do and what um, all of the things that I needed to learn. And at least it had a person that I could reach out to. And then once you have run, no um, matter whether what 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 happened, but again, being able to reach out and mentor others, I think that's really important. Also, it was really important that I was a member of the league. The league gained a lot of information from that as well. And so a lot of the organizations you're involved with, as was mentioned, you bring your disability everywhere you go. And so every day is an interview. And that also means that everything that you're doing and everybody that you're talking to, that's part of your interview process. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I, echoing everything everyone else has said, um, I, I think the, the common theme here is really start local. 
you know, I will get people who come to me saying they want to run for Congress, which is great. Um, but we're really, we need to work on building this pipeline from the bottom up, particularly for people who haven't run for office before, uh, looking at the local community and how you get involved, whether that is a local elected office position, a, a board, a count, uh, town commission, um, volunteering for a campaign, uh, working as staff on a campaign. Um, all of these things are so important and um, you know, we, we need to work from the ground up here and really build this pipeline and getting involved in these other programs as well. Again, um, looking at the different campaign trainings, our leadership development programs out there, there are often ones that are very focused on state and local communities as well. I'm sure there's probably several in Florida, um, but getting involved that way or through your political party, for example, um, those are all really great ways to get experience and to get out there and start, um, you know, working towards this goal of, of of getting more involved in the community. I like to say disabled people were, natu were natural problem solvers and that makes us, that gives us really good leadership qualities. Um, we are used to living in a world that isn't built for us and navigating that. And um, that gives us a lot of leadership skills around being resilient and adaptable and creative with our solutions, which makes us really great additions to the local, um, you know, elected officials, um, different boards and commissions that are out there. So harnessing those natural skills and, and using those, I think, is really important. Thank you, Natalie, Sarah, Kara, Kara, Kara for your expertise and your advice. Um, I, I have another question for you all. Um, how can candidates with disabilities avoid their disability potentially overshad overshadowing the reasons why they are running for office. I don't really think that this is Carolyn. I really don't think that it needs to be overshadowing. I mean, I, I, I think that we all bring our disability everywhere we go. I think that it's important to just bring it out and talk about it. And basically, there's the elephant in the room. Talk about it. Everybody's going to see. It's obvious. So let's just make it, turn that what potential, what people consider a potential negative into a positive. As was mentioned, we've been doing this all our lives or however long we've been disabled because that's just how you navigate life. And so I think that it's important to not look at it as a overshadowing or a negative thing. I think it's important to look at it as we are freaking adaptable. Mm -hmm. We are resilient. We are able to do whatever we want, whatever we set our mind to, and just be able to show the world that that's basically what we're able to do, whether we are wheelchair users, whether we have service animals, whether we have canes, whatever our situation is, we're usually able to navigate the world in spite of that. Also doing our everyday stuff, whether you're a parent, whether you're a sister, brother, wife, whatever the case may be, we're doing all the other stuff everybody else does. And then you add the other layer of dealing with the disability and the challenges that goes along with it. So we are advocates because we have to be, and we are resilient and agile because we've learned to be. And I think those are all incredible positive things that we bring everywhere we go. Thank you for speaking. Truth. This is Natalie. I, you know, and, and I would just add to that. It's like, I think that because our disability comes with us, we don't have to say anything. And, and I think one of the things that when you are, you know, running for office, you want to look at what are the issues that would be if you were not, if you didn't have a disability, what are the issues that they would be talking about? And I think if you can be well-versed in the other community issues or the other issues within whatever position you're trying to get, that's going to show where you're at. And the disability is there, but showing that you're capable of knowing all of this other information and being able to articulate uh, and, and about all of those subjects, that's really going to make the difference. Don't bring disability into everything while you're on the campaign. That is totally there for after you get a. I, 
I, I agree. This, this care, I agree um, with that. I, I think, you know, as you are following the different issues and as you get involved and you figure out what your platform would be or what the issues that you are, that you do want to advocate for, um, definitely focus on that. I mean, with not all disabilities are visible, some are. So I think, you know, if people have questions and like they were talking about earlier with the alligator skin, if they ask you a question, answer it. If they either like you or they don't, they'll vote for you on your platform or on your previous voting record if you've been in office. So I think it's just one of those things that we just, we just have to work through it and, and focus on what our whole platforms are and getting the message out for the entire community. This is Carolyn again, one real um, quick add. Um, I think it's also very important, as was mentioned, you know, answer questions. I think that as a person with a disability, we have, I think in a lot of aspects, we're very good listeners. And I think that's really, really, really important, especially on the campaign while you're talking to your constituents, et cetera. I think that's very important. We've also been in the situation where we've been in a lot of cases realm of a of a ladder and so we know what it's like to be in a bad situation yep. we know what it's like to be ssi or be on you know very low income situations we are the marginalized community and so a lot of people vote because they feel that they're not being heard and we are that community so i think that when we talk to people in the aspect that we understand to some degree, we, 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 we're we there, we understand your concerns. Um, our concerns are slightly different, but we still feel your pain in a lot of aspects. I think that's really important because we truly do. We've been there. We, we weren't just given everything. And even if you were born into absolute riches or whatever, you have a lot of things to overcome. And I certainly wasn't, but you know, the point being is we have overcome a lot to get to the situation we are. And I think that, as was mentioned, sharing that message, um, just being positive about where you are and listening to everybody, listening to while we're on the campaign trail, I think that's very, very helpful. Thank you. You're here. I, I definitely agree. I think, this is Kara, I definitely think listening is important. And I know um, with having my background, and I know usually when you do run for office, there are individuals that run businesses and or lawyers. Those are usually the ones that usually do run for office. But if you do have the social service background and or have a disability or both, um, you know, being able to work through that and listen to them, you do have a different perspective and you're able to um, validate um, their concerns and or feelings. Which brings me to the last simple question. You kind of answered it, but um, what would you say to someone outside of the disability community who may be hesitant to vote for a candidate with a disability? So me personally, if some, this is Natalie, um, if somebody not in the disability community was asking me why they should vote for me, you know, first and foremost, like Carolyn said earlier, I, I would ask them, you know, well, you know, what's important. I would hope I had that conversation first. And if I know it's important to them, you know, then I'm going to focus on that. And, and if they're, if they're mentioning my disability, like, oh, why do I vote for you because you're disabled, you know, then, then that's easy for me to say, that's easy for me to say, Hey, you know, I might have a, a, a disability, but that doesn't make it where I'm not able to do the job that I'm trying to do. And say for anybody if if you're talking to people without disabilities i think we educate people one person at a time and so somebody who's not familiar with your type of disability or anybody with a disability in the community i think it's very easy for you to be able to educate them on what we can do you know that we all have our abilities everybody in this world and i don't care if you have a disability or not Everybody has their pros, everybody has their cons, and we just need to make sure that focusing on everybody's pros so we can make a better community. Thank you for that advice. Uh, yeah, this is Sarah. I would say, you know, if someone is saying that they 
don't want to vote for someone with a disability, I would really want to drill down into getting their reasoning why they feel that way and working to change the attitudes, you know, um, if, if it's, if the question is that they believe someone is not capable of running for office with a disability or they're not going to be a good leader, I think there there's, you know, we have to have conversations with people as hurtful as it can be um, for us to encounter those attitudes and try to um, dispel the, the myths and the, the prejudices that they have in their mind. And so, you know, really, drilling down on, on disabled people are great leaders. And we have examples out there. We have so many people who have run for office and served in an elected office with a disability. And there's more and more who are being open about it. And I think that movement is gonna be really important in uh, you know, giving people stories and, and sharing stories about um, elected officials with disabilities. Um, so I would say, you know, kind of looking at those attitudes, figuring out how we can change them. And of course, you know, sharing your story as an elected official or a candidate with a disability, talking about this and, and being open as much as you are comfortable um, sharing that so that it becomes much more normalized that people with disabilities are running for elected office and we can kind of shift the culture around that. This, this is Kara. I, I, think, I think sharing sharing the stories as much as you can and why not I mean we can do everything just like everybody else it might just look a little bit different for each individual person we every every candidate has their own opinion or whatever we it just might take us longer to go you know we might have to sit at the table differently or have extra space or have a ramp put in for us to be able to get there you know why not um you know look at the platform and what they what they stand for and and how they advocate for the different issues and make that choice from there you know, either go through the par through the party politics, if it's a partisan race or even nonpartisan race, look at the individual and make that choice from there. You know, it could be based on age or anything else. So um, I think why not give them a try? And, you know, like Sarah said, I, I, I saw a bumper sticker once that said attitudes are the real disability. And that's for every candidate with or without a disability. This is Kim. I definitely agree with what was said. Um, as was mentioned, basically every every time somebody has that potential negative process, um, it listen to what they what their concerns are. I think it's also very important that, as was mentioned, every situation we deal with differently, possibly, but at least we are listening. The aspect of after listening, talking, and seeing, you know, where those concerns are, I'm sure everybody has somebody that they know who has been disabled, and they have positive and negative feelings about that. I think, again, talking about the positives that we bring to the table, I think is very important. The aspect that it's a teachable moment. So here's a great time to have that teachable moment. I think it's another aspect to basically talk about your history and what are the things that you've overcome? What are the things that people told you you couldn't do and still did? And so I think a lot of it is sometimes dispelling those myths with what you've actually done, what you've actually accomplished to show them what you've accomplished. Obviously, people are still going to do what they think they're going to do, but it's helpful to provide that information. And you know, I think that based on what people are comfortable with and what they are able to do, a lot of what I think is helpful sometimes, depending upon the situation, is to say, hey, look, we are advocates for people with disabilities and everybody else. Because if we talk about universal design and how things are, are built, how things are designed, we are designing it for everybody. And that stable community is a community that anybody can join at any time and they're welcome. And so whether it's temporarily or whether it's permanently, we are there to be able to make sure that if anybody joins our community, that we already have some of the infrastructure in place, that we're thinking about that infrastructure. And that's really why we're there. That's why we're running. We're running for representation. We're running to make sure that we have infrastructure in place. And part of that infrastructure is having candidates and elected officials in place to be able to get others to do the same. Thank you, Carolyn. 
Um, we would like to um, ask audience uh, to, we have some questions from our audience. So Tony, if there are any questions in the chat, can you please let us know what they are for our panelists? Yeah, thank you, Danielle. Thank you so much. And, and thanks to our panelists. I, I really appreciated this discussion. I think representation, no surprise, is the heart of the matter. And so whether that's poll workers with disabilities, election officials with disabilities, or elected officials with disabilities, this is the real game changer. Um, so we had one question come from Damien, and then I think our other co-moderator, Mira, might have some questions if there's a chance. Uh, but Damien's question was, we've discussed a whole bunch about uh, implicit bias and discrimination on the campaign trail, but have any of our panelists experienced uh, ableism or overt ableism while running for office? And how did they deal with it if they did? I, I didn't have to deal with that. I really can't think of anything significant ableism wise that we that I've had to deal with. Um, the main challenge that I think that my, myself and other candidates who are running for the soil and water position, we had to deal with when the governor signed uh, Bill 1078 and it was signed, it was signed June 15th that night. We were supposed to have our candidate information in that we were candidates um, on the on the 17th at noon. And so some of the challenges that we had is that on the 16th, because it was signed that the night before, people were still trying to figure out what to do, etc. So it put a lot of us because everybody had to run at the same time. It put a lot of us in a situation where we had to figure out how to run, uh, what we needed to do, what documents we needed to do while they were still figuring it out. So ableism, not, you know, it, it, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a stick, not, not exactly, but it was the aspect of assuming that everybody was in the same boat and everybody had a transportation, everybody had the ability to just get down to supervisor of elections office and change or register or whatever they had to do. And everybody's in a different situation than I am. And that, that made it very challenging. Thank you. Now we got one question from our audience. How can we advocate for people with invisible disabilities in office and ensure that they could get accommodations they need but aren't perceived to? to need. You're on mute, Kara. This is Kara. What I what I would think in regards to that would be the self advocacy um, and, and and to be able for them to be able to work with to see what the accommodations that they would need, because that's an individual choice um, as to what accommodations they would need on the campaign trail. And and then I think uh, that would also be like when you put your team together, make sure that your team members all know that what your needs are and what what your expectations are. If they're going out and speaking on your behalf, or if there's if you need extra time, if you need to sit while you're giving a speech or stand, or if you need to have written notes or a computer in front of you, you know any any types of of those types of things, or if you need documents in large print or braille, you know making sure um, that all of that is available. But I think it starts with self advocacy. Yeah, I would agree. It's, it's a very individual thing and only the person themselves can request accommodations. But I think one thing that we can do to, um, to kind of assist with making people feel comfortable with doing that is, you know, um, again, sharing stories on uh, elected officials with disabilities, encouraging people to share their own stories and be open about it and making it so that people are comfortable with identifying with the disability community um, are not worried that they uh, could be seen as not disabled enough to make accommodation or request accommodations. Uh, and 
just kind of normalizing disability and, and the way that disability can look uh, so that people are, are comfortable and are educated on what their rights are to request accommodations. Speaking as someone who has a primarily invisible disability, um, it, was, it took a long time for me to understand that I was part of the community and that I was uh, you know, allowed to make accommodations requests. Um, or that I was, you know, quote unquote, disabled enough. Um, so making sure that people have the knowledge that they need to request accommodations and, and making it so that disability is accepted in the political environment are really important. Thank you so much for the wonderful work that you all do um, in your areas and I hope that we see future um, people with disabilities running for office and, and making our world a place just by being who we are and advocating and helping others is the main thing. Anything else you would like to add? I would just say that actually I did think of an ableist thing. I, I um, because with being being on the blind spectrum, that a lot of the time if I'm wearing sunglasses or something that my vision might not be as visible, my, my how my eyes shake, et cetera, might not be as visible. Um, so sometimes that happens. However, I know I've been told, well, you don't look enough. <laughs> and that's kind of interesting <laughs> when you are on the, you know, when you're part of the disabled community, that is, again, an aspect that people think that you have to look a certain way. Um, so as was mentioned, I think a lot of it is making sure that we're being good advocates, that we're asking for what we need, and that we are teaching others to ask people for what they might, you know, hey, do you need any assistance? You know, and because we tend to be in that boat ourselves. So a lot of that is things that we are constantly learning and things that we are constantly improving and showing and helping others to be able to be in that same boat, whether visible or invisible. Thank you. And this is Natalie. I, I just want to say that, you know, when we're talking about volunteer, we're talking about all of this stuff, just remember the more people you talk to, the more family members, so those are going to be the people that go on your team. So if you volunteer, you know, in the, where you want to be, like if you want to be a city council person or if you want to be a senator and you're, you know, volunteering their office, then that might be a really good thing when you go to run, because if that person has a good experience with you, then they may actually publicly say, oh, yes, I fully support, you know, so-and-so for whatever seat, you know, and, and you don't realize mm -hmm. who is going to be your biggest cheerleaders. So always treat everybody that you're you're dealing with. That's going to be the person who's going to help me move forward, you know, because you're not going to do it by yourself. You know, you need other people's support. And I think just, you know, always having that mindset is going to be helpful. And, and I know just to follow up on the hidden disability, you know, it, even with me having a very visual disability, I know that I still have to advocate for myself. And there's sometimes the only person who knows what I need to have as an accommodation for something is me. You know, other people might think they know I need. They may say, oh, hey, let me do this or this. But if this or this is not going to help me, then, you know, so so I think we need to be supportive of each other. And when you know other people with disabilities who are wanting to run for office or who are wanting to get any kind of you know, uh, leadership capacity. I think that we need to be making sure we're mentoring each other and we're we're pointing out, you know, because at the end of the day, I know Olivia over there, she's, you know, she or Kara over there, they're going to be the first two people that are going to tell me, hey, you might want to do that, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it comes better from somebody that, that you know, also has a disability, is, is feeling comfortable, and you know that they're saying it, you know, in an aspect to help you. Thank you for that wonderful piece of advice. I'm going to pass it to Robin. Thank you all very much. I um, appreciate everybody being here today. 
Um, I want to remind everybody that uh, we'll save the questions that are in the chat and answer those after the summit. And then uh, if anyone wants to submit a question, they can do so at uh, communications group at disabilityrightsflorida.org. So to close out our summit today, I want to introduce our executive director with Disability Rights Florida, Peter Sleesman. Thank you. Um, I am Pete Sleesman. I'm the Executive Director of Disability Rights Florida, and I want to start off by thanking everyone, uh, both here in Tampa and those who uh, participated online, um, for, for being a part of the 2022 Elections Accessibility Summit, a path to civil inclusion. Um, I especially want to thank um, the Access to Vote Florida Coalition um, for their hard work and involvement to make this summit become a reality. And I also wanna thank uh, all of the DRF staff who worked very hard uh, to pull this together and actually make it a reality. Uh, I especially would like to thank our keynote speaker, Emily Vorty. And I'd thank, like to thank the panelists um, on the make, uh, Making Vote by Mail Accessible, Aaron Wilson, Marilyn Baldwin, Doug Hall, Alex Mosca, Marsha Bacala, and Brian Finney. Uh, on understanding the disability vote, uh, Michelle Bishop, Brad Ashwell, Michelle Cantor Cohen, Doug Cruz, uh, Thomas Hicks, and uh, Amy Keith. And at the crossroads of identity, Jaslyn Gallego, David Darm, Sarah Goldman, Nadine Smith, and Cecile Schoon. And finally, um, running for office as a person with disability, our very own Natalie Alden. Uh, Sarah Blakovic, uh, Karen Campbell, and Kara Tucker. Um, I think some of the things that kind of came through from these panels today was that people with disabilities uh, are active and engaged in the political process, and that disability crosses all party lines and is not a partisan issue. Um, full civic engagement is an essential is, is an essential element of democratic process. Process, if our government is ever to achieve the goal of being of the people, by the people, and for the people. Inclusive political participation and civic engagement starts with ensuring that people with disabilities can access the ballot box. Um, and that includes not just voting, but also, as we just pointed out, running for office. Um, however, uh, there continues to be a lot of systemic barriers, including ableism and other challenges to people with disabilities being fully engaged in the political process. Also, people of color and people who are in the LGD, LGBTQI community continue to have even greater uh, barriers to their participation, civic engagement, uh, and having some kind of meaningful influence over government civic life. One of the major themes that we kind of, that was clear today is there's a lot of work to be done even still to include, to increase voting accessibility and other civic inclusion. There's a need for advocacy, both federal, state, and local levels. There's a need for education, both of policymakers and individuals to let them know what their rights are. And as Emily Vorey pointed out, there's an increased need and especially great need for people with disabilities to tell their stories um, and how persuasive storytelling can really be um, to influencing the discourse. The discussions that are taking place here today are part of a larger effort um, and a continued conversation on how to break down the barriers to full civic inclusion. And there's great, great urgency to the work. We've got important um, elections coming up this fall and even more important voting, um, voting elections coming up next year. So there's a lot of work still to be done. Along the lines, I just kind of wanted to mention that uh, Disability Rights Florida has a voting hotline. Um, you can find it on our website, but we'll also give it to you here. It's 1-800-342-0823. And we have a special extension 6000 where you can make an inquiry online um, or at accessthevote.org forward slash contact us to let us know about voting issues. And 
sure, and we'll have it we'll have it posted at some point. But it's one 0823 and it's extension six thousand. Yes, yes, absolutely. No, I, I don't think it's open 24 seven. It's gonna be open during um, regular business hours, but we will have uh, trained um, live responders uh, to answer questions. Sure, um, thank you for the question. If you also, if you have legal issues you wanna discuss, uh, we have staff here today. We have an intake table uh, across the hall uh, in the hotel where you can talk with some of our trained intake specialists, including the lovely Dawn uh, after the summit and, um, and talk to them about if you, you know, if you need assistance, direct assistance from Disability Rights Florida on any particular issue. If you wanna learn more about Access to Vote Florida Coalition or Disability Rights Florida, there's an information table uh, out in the hall uh, where you can pick up some additional bling and also folders and other information about Disability Rights Florida. Uh, finally, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it on National Voter Registration Day. Uh, we have trained staff, Olivia and Laura Lee uh, in particular, are registering qualified Florida residents to vote. So anyone interested in registering to vote can see them in the lobby at the check-in table, and we'd be happy to help you out with that. So again, thank you very much for attending. Uh, we really do appreciate it. And we hope it was a, uh, a great session for all of you. Thank you.